when I was 30 years old, I had saved enough money to buy my first house. It wasn't anything special, and honestly, all things considered, it wasn't in the best neighborhood either. But I was still proud of the accomplishment nonetheless. I had met all the nearby neighbors in, I'd say, the first two weeks I moved in. Considering the neighborhood, I was surprised to discover they all actually seemed pretty nice. A couple of them even invited me over for dinner a few times. And having lived in different apartments all my life, this wasn't really something I was used to. Of course, they weren't all like this, however. Two houses down from the house I moved into lived a man that was probably 50 years old. Upon moving in, every other night or so, the dude would knock at my front door at some absurd hour asking for stuff. So, like, as an example, the first time it happened, he asked me if I had any spare bread I wasn't going to eat. Another time, he asked me if I could fill up a bucket with water because his was turned off. It was just random, but somewhat understandable things like that. But I drew the line when he started asking me for money. I figured I had no obligation to be constantly meeting this guy's needs. I mean, I had pretty much just met the dude. I had started opening the door to his knocks less and less, but this didn't seem to have any effect on the number of times he would show up. Fast forward to a night a few weeks later, and again another knock. I had planned to ignore it, like I had grown accustomed to doing by that point. But as I looked through the people, I noticed the guy looked distressed. Seeing this, I decided the right thing to do would be to open up the door. So, I did. I asked him what he needed, and what he responded with was not at all the type of response I was expecting. He asked me if I could come over and show him how to use his new grill. Now, this happened around midnight, which in my opinion was an extremely odd time to start grilling. But, against my better judgement, I decided I would help him. I was pretty into cooking at that point in my life, and figured taking 10 minutes to show the guy how a grill worked wouldn't be the end of the world. I told him that I'd be over in a second, and that I just needed to put some shoes on. He thanked me and started walking back. A couple minutes later, and I made my way over to his house. I opened some gate and walked into his backyard. It was dark, so it was hard to see, but it was clear there was no grill. On top of that, the guy was nowhere in sight. Although his back door was wide open, I stuck my hand inside and yelled out for the guy. Yeah, I'm down here. I need your help getting some meat from the freezer. The muffled response came from down a set of stairs just to the left of me. I was hesitant to go down. There were no lights on down there. In fact, there wasn't a single light on throughout the whole house. I yelled down the stairs, asking him if he could turn on a light so I could see. There was silence for a few seconds. Eventually, he responded. No, they're broken. I can't do that. I knew something was off at that point. I yelled back something like, I think I'm just gonna go, man. I kid you not, the second after I said this, audible footsteps started sprinting up the stairs. My flight reaction kicked in immediately. I ran directly back to my house and locked the door behind me. I pulled back a set of curtains and looked out one of my windows, but I didn't see anything. I was terrified. I thought about calling the police, but decided against it, figuring I really wouldn't be able to prove anything that just happened. For the next few days, I didn't leave my house for anything except work. During those days, I never saw the guy, nor did any late night knocks occur. Exactly one week after it happened, I was talking with my neighbor across the street. The conversation eventually landed on what I experienced and how I was planning to move because of it. But I was just met with a look of confusion. I was then informed that no one lived in the house I was talking about. It had been abandoned for two years. This prompted my neighbor to call the police. However, the police would find nothing inside or around the house. I moved out a few weeks later, so that's all I know. I'm not sure if anything else came from the situation or not. I still don't know who that guy was, or what he was trying to lure me into. This happened during the summer before my sophomore year in college. At that time, I was doing a lot of research for a place I could live during the coming school year that was close to campus. I found multiple good-looking apartments, but all of them were way out of my budget. I quickly figured out that if I wanted to live close to campus, I would need a roommate that could help pay each month's rent. I posted an ad on Craigslist explaining my situation, hoping someone would be interested. Not even an hour after I posted the ad, I got a response. Apparently, it was some older lady in her 70s. I was kind of expecting it to be another student from my university, but I figured it didn't really matter. As long as they were willing to pay half of the rent, I didn't really care. 
Plus, I didn't get any further responses in the next week, so I took the one opportunity I was given. Fast forward to the start of the school semester, and the two of us moved in. She introduced herself as Dorothy. She was short and had white hair. Although a little quiet, she seemed nice. I figured we'd get along fine, so I wasn't too worried about the coming months. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We had the occasional small talk conversation when we were both in the kitchen, but that was about it. For the most part, she would spend all of her time in her bedroom. Occasionally, while I was watching TV in the living room at night, I would hear this high-pitched giggling coming through the walls. <laughs> The first few times it happened, I just assumed she was on her phone or something. But then I realized I never actually heard her talking. It was just her giggling. I couldn't imagine what she was doing. Over time, things just kept getting weirder. For example, she would start coming out of her room for no other purpose than to watch me. She would stand in the kitchen or hallway just looking at me while I watched TV or made myself dinner. Needless to say, I was getting more and more uncomfortable around her. One night, I woke up at around 3 a.m. to the sound of slight knocking on my bedroom door. Not knocking like trying to get my attention, but slow, soft, and barely audible knocking. I yelled out Dorothy's name, and right as I did, the knocking stopped. I knew it was her, because shortly after, I heard her same giggling, <laughs> followed my footsteps walking back to her room. I'd be lying if I said this didn't freak me out. I didn't have a lock on my door, so nothing was stopping her from coming into my room while I was sleeping. I didn't sleep at all the rest of that night. I had planned on confronting her about the situation the next day, but she never left her room once. Come night again, and I decided to move my desk in front of my door as a makeshift barricade. Cause, I mean, again, I didn't have a lock on my door, and I did not feel comfortable having nothing stopping her from entering my room. Three hours later and I woke up to the sound of my desk being hit by my door from someone attempting to open it. It was Dorothy. I could see her eye peeking through the crack of the slightly open door. Before I could even say anything, she started screaming and banging on my door. And my desk started to give way, so I got out of bed and held the door closed myself. The screaming and banging went on for two more minutes. Once it finally stopped, I got up and called the police. When they arrived, I opened the door to my bedroom, and my heart dropped. Every single one of the knives from our kitchen had been stabbed into the door. I was absolutely horrified, but I tried to compose myself. I briefly explained the situation to the two officers that arrived. I also told them which room Dorothy was in. She would provide a struggle in being detained, but they would ultimately take her away. The next month, I would move to another apartment this time with some actual students from my university. I still don't understand what made Dorothy do what she did. My best guess is she had some severe untreated condition she wasn't on medication for. But then again, maybe not. Maybe she seriously intended to use those knives on me in my sleep. But because I took the precaution of pushing my desk in front of my door, I luckily didn't have to find out. This experience happened to me when I was only 10 years old. Being that it was so long ago, I don't remember every small detail, but I'll do my best to keep everything as accurate as possible. Back then, I lived in a considerably remote area in the US. Neighboring houses were a good half mile apart. Therefore, while my family had met a couple of our neighbors, many of them were complete strangers. This included the resident of the house to the left of ours. I don't remember his name, but it was an elderly man that lived there. He was creepy to say the least. All of the windows on his house were spray painted so that no one could see inside, and his whole yard was completely overgrown. I know all this because every Monday through Friday I had to walk past his house to get home from school. Every time I did this, the man would either be standing on his porch watching me or trying to make conversation with me as I walked by. It got to the point where I dreaded walking home from school just because I'd have to walk past him. But this wasn't even the worst of it. Maybe once or twice a month, the guy would make the half mile walk to our house in the middle of the night. He would then shine a flashlight into the window of my room. I knew it was the same guy too, cause one of the times I witnessed him walking down the road towards our house. Looking back, this was 100% extremely alarming behavior. But at the time, I thought the best way of handling it was just to ignore it. Therefore, I didn't tell my parents about it. 
I also remember reasoning that my bedroom was on the second floor, so it's not like he was able to see much of inside my room anyway. Skip to a summer night in that same year, and I was once again woken up by the light of a flashlight shining in my room. Though, this time it was followed by a subtle thud sound against the wall. It felt like my heart had stopped. The only thing running through my mind in that moment was how it sounded exactly like a ladder being propped up against the side of the house. Not long later, my suspicions would be confirmed. A knocking sound rang out from the glass of the window. I looked over and was met with the smiling face of the man gesturing me to open the window. But no, I screamed and ran to my parents' bedroom. I desperately explained to them how the neighbor was outside my window. They went in my room, but of course he was gone by that point. The worst part is, they didn't even believe me, chalking it up to me seeing things. Therefore, the police were never called. But even now as an adult, I know exactly what I saw. I tried not to think about the intentions that guy had towards my 10 year old self. I never saw him again after that. In fact, not even a week after the occurrence and his house had a for sale sign up next to it, which to me serves as further proof that it was him. I've lived in many different places since then, and not one neighbor comes even slightly close to how creepy that man was. My family and I have been living in a homeless shelter since the very first day that my city was officially on lockdown. The complex used to be an old motel and in each room there's about four people. Thankfully since mine is the only family here, we get to have a room to ourselves. That being said, we've been through a number of neighbors on either side of our room and as you can expect, not all of them were good. You have your typical druggies and mentally unstable people, but surprisingly, the worst was a man that we had actually become friends with. Let's call him David. David had been one of our first set of neighbors on the left side. He was a bald man in his late 20s to early 30s of average height and build. He wore glasses, a bright red beard, and he had a friendly disposition. My parents had started talking to him whenever they went outside for a smoke. My mother could talk to anyone, and she would always make friends, but my dad, well, he's a bit more reserved and introverted, a lot like me. So the fact that he had also started talking to David made me immediately trust him. A horrible decision. My mother eventually insisted that I come meet him. He was exactly the kind of person that I usually get along with. He was mildly crude, sarcastic, and always down to talk about really deep and dark things. I befriended him rather quickly and we discussed everything from stupid conspiracy theories to even childhood trauma. Both me and my 16 year old brother were actually really quite fond of him, but this obviously didn't last. It started out small. He would talk about sex, his previous wife's affairs, and things of that nature. At first I was really happy that he was talking to me like an adult. I had just turned 18 years old in February and I was still a little shocked about how differently people were treating me. Things had started to escalate fairly soon after that. He started hitting on me and talking about a hypothetical relationship between us. I'm pretty used to this kind of behavior as I've been creeped on long before anywhere near the age of consent, but it still felt wrong that a man that was a bare minimum of 10 years older than me was being so forward to my barely legal self. However, I'm extremely unsocial and I recently lost the remainder of all my friends, so I was just really desperate for human contact outside of my family, so I would just politely decline him and just laugh it off. One day when my parents and I were all outside, David came outside as well. He made really friendly conversations with us and eventually the topic drifted into the staff that work here. For some context, there's always staff and at least one security guard that's working at all times. They do room checks, symptom checks, deliver meals, do laundry, and so on. Most of them are pretty chill, but there are a few of them who really abuse their power and make the residents' lives miserable. Also, the owners are super shady and do a lot of things that aren't exactly okay. So when David had then said that the security guard was going around the back of the building and looking in bathroom windows to make sure no one was smoking or doing drugs in there, well, my parents believed him. 
They really just hate the way the place is run and they're always mad about something. So they were pretty quick to board the how dare they train. I, on the other hand, just took the information with a grain of salt. I wasn't so eager to believe in rumors that really have no ground to stand on. For all I knew, it could have been started by a junkie that was tripping and just thinking what he was seeing was real. A few nights later, when I was using the bathroom, I had heard the crunching of footsteps right outside. Now, the complex is surrounded by orchards, so it's not really uncommon to hear walking among the trees, but something in the pit of my stomach told me something was off. I snapped my head up just in time to then see a pale figure jerk away from the bug screen right on the open window. I quickly finished up, all the while the window never leaving my line of sight. The moment my pants are up, I decide to bolt and then run to tell my parents. They're pretty much both beyond pissed. They pretty much immediately assumed that it was security. That is, until they open our door only moments after the occurrence, to then see that the only security that was working on that night was still up at the front gate. Not only that, but the man wasn't white. So whoever's face I saw, it wasn't him. This immediately confused them. On the next morning, my parents are asking everyone if they saw or heard anyone outside their bathroom windows last night. There was a resounding no from everyone, but what really struck me as odd the most was that no one had even heard of the rumor about security. It seems like everyone here is extremely paranoid, so the fact that such a serious accusation was apparently not even being discussed was more than a bit strange to me. My parents just assumed that David had just been messing with us or that someone had been messing with him. I wanted to believe that too. After that, I was so freaked out that I started closing the window every time I went in there. Right around this time, the weather started getting really warm, which meant that clothes started getting more revealing so that we wouldn't fry in the late spring sun. I guess this was a little too much for David to handle, as he started being even more forward than he was before even around my parents. This didn't sit well with them. It eventually got so bad that they requested he be moved to a different room. He wasn't. I started staying inside at all times when I could and just avoiding David when I couldn't. He must have noticed this as he became increasingly aggressive every time he approached me. He would always holler at me from across the complex and also watch me intently whenever I walked my dog. I had started noticing a very David-shaped silhouette right outside our window in the dead of night whenever my family was asleep, peeking into the tiny gaps in the thin curtains. I would really like to say that I told my parents, but I didn't. I was really afraid that they would make a big stink about it and that we'd get kicked out and then have nowhere to go in the middle of a pandemic, so I just kept quiet. David was eventually moved, but not before he scared me one last time. I was once again in the bathroom. I had just gotten out of the shower, and I was brushing my teeth with my towel wrapped around my body. I had music playing and was dancing around, just generally having a good time. It was such a good time that I apparently forgot that I didn't close the window. I had left it open during my shower to reduce the amount of steam, and I meant to close it when I got out. Thankfully, the shower was on the same wall as the window, making it physically impossible to see into it. The sink that I was standing at, however, well, that was in full view of the window. This realization then hit me like a ton of bricks, when I then suddenly became hyper aware of the feeling of being watched. I tried to act natural really hoping it was just my paranoia. I finished brushing my teeth, then opened up the medicine cabinet to put away my toothbrush. As I was closing it, I made sure to stop at an angle where I could see the reflection of the window in the mirror. Lo and behold, there he was. David was stood there with his face pressed against the bug screen. I was frozen in fear. The worst part was when he realized he had been caught, he didn't even move away immediately. He didn't even have the decency to look shocked or ashamed. No. He looked so smug, so self-satisfied. And then he moved with his footsteps crunched off into the distance. I never saw him again after that, 
and I never told my parents about it or about him watching me while I slept. It still really freaks me out to think about it, especially since he has two daughters of his own. I only hope that they're never put into his custody. Even if he doesn't do anything to them, I really can't imagine what growing up with a father that acts like this would do to a girl. Somehow I really don't think that he'd set a very good standard for them. Hopefully you all agree with me. Just for some context, I'm about 5 foot 6 and about 220 pounds, and I'm 15 years old. I'm also in high school and I don't really like talking to people, as I have the worst anxiety. I would say I'm fairly good looking, but nothing to gush about, and a little bit on the bigger side. The story happened in November of 2019. It was a normal day, and I actually had a really great day. I knew that if I enjoyed myself in school though, that something bad was probably going to be happening at home. I never enjoy myself in school. Everything was pretty good up until my walk home. When school was over, I got on the bus as normal. The ride seemed faster than normal that day. Something was telling me that I needed to call my mom to pick me up from the bus stop, but I couldn't. The previous day, I had gotten my phone taken away for personal reasons. Anyways, I got to my stop and got off. I walked and I'm about halfway home when I suddenly feel that feeling when you just know someone is watching you. I can't really explain it, but I felt it. I'm now in my neighborhood and there's barely any cars anywhere riding past. The street that I live on is like a horseshoe. It's kind of like a hill. Most of the people on my street are older and barely ever leave their houses. As I was walking down the street, a young man walks out of a house. He looked about 17 years old, 6 foot 3, and had a muscly build. His body didn't really match his age, but I didn't really pay any attention, thinking that maybe he played sports because our town is pretty big on sports and training. Usually I would pull out my phone and act like I didn't see or hear someone trying to talk to me, but today I couldn't do that. He smiled and waved at me and I did the same because I didn't want to be rude. Suddenly he walked all the way down his driveway and then struck up a conversation with me. At first, it was just typical small talk as usual. Then he began to move closer and before I knew it, he had his hand right on the small of my back, then guiding me right up the driveway. I asked him what he was doing and he continued to walk me up the driveway. I tried to struggle but he wrapped his arm around my waist so tightly and just continued. I started to yell at him to let me go, but then he put his hand right over my mouth and I was silenced. I honestly thought that I would never see my family again, never experience prom, homecoming, get a job, get married, you know, all of the things you're supposed to do in life. I didn't want to be near him one more second, so I had to think. What could I do to at least stun him? I decided to bite his hand. He then let go and started to scream in pain. After he let go, I ran down the street and then pulled my key and stumbled to get my key into the door. When I turned to look back, I saw him running down the street absolutely enraged. He didn't yell or say anything, just ran. I eventually unlocked the door and stumbled into the house and then locked it. I ran to my room and then closed the door. Almost immediately, my mother yells up to me and asks me what's wrong. I say nothing and I just sit there, too in shock to cry or to do anything. Yesterday I went for a walk and I had finally decided that I was ready to go back outside and right as I made my way up to the hill to the top of the street, a wave of dread then washed over me. I wanted to turn back but I decided to take the horseshoe back around to my house. I made it past the house and before I knew it, I was right on the other side of the horseshoe. The feeling was still there. Since we're in quarantine, I was really surprised to see a figure walking behind me. He had a really large dog with him and he had then walked with long strides. He then caught up to me rather quickly. As soon as I saw his face, I stopped. I couldn't move. He then started to smile with such a creepy smile. Even now, I can't get it out of my head. Every time I close my eyes, he's there. He had started to wander down the street until he slowly walked up to me. Hey, remember me? I couldn't respond. 
You know, it was really rude the way you ran away from me the last time we spoke. He moved a little closer until his lips were right on my ear. I'm gonna make sure you don't run this time. I snapped out of my trance when I once again felt his hand on my waist. This time, however, he wasn't even trying to be gentle. He was practically ripping my shirt. Just then at that moment, I had saw a car turn down my street and I started waving my hands like a crazy person. By the time they slowed down to see what was wrong, he was gone. He must have ran through the people's yards or something. Hey, are you good? Everything okay here? It was my neighbor's eldest son. I was so grateful for him being there. I then totally broke down. He ended up driving me down the street to my home, and despite having him right next to me while I told my parents, they didn't believe me. It's so frustrating that the ones that are supposed to be there for you think that you're lying about something so serious. Since they don't believe me, I decided to write it here. I haven't ran into the guy since, and I'm really glad. I hope sharing my story will help someone. Just be careful out there. I used to live with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. Hector was this six-foot Afro-Latino dude from New Jersey who had two distinct modes of being. Either he was a tornado of anger, or he was manically laughing at something. Rarely was there any in-between. When you caught him in his laughing mood, he was tolerable at best, but catch him in one of his angry moods and he was totally unbearable. He was a roadie for some post-hardcore band that toured up and down the East Coast a bunch, which was one of the few good things about being his roommate. The fact that he spent weeks away at a time from the apartment, but still paid rent. But whenever he was home... Well, here's an example. It's July in East Harlem. I have the windows open. Latin brass band music is flowing through the afternoon air from some other open window, and I'm sipping southern peach lemonade like life is good. Out of nowhere, Hector bursts into the apartment, covered in brick dust like, I need bricks, bro. You got bricks? I just started driving Uber while trying to get my stand-up career up and running, so no, I didn't have any bricks. And even if I did, I wouldn't have been sharing them with Hector. And suddenly he's like, there's bricks on the roof. And as he runs out of the apartment and towards the stairwell of the building, I hear these kids shouting from outside the window. Then I look out to see this group of kids, like 11 year old kids all shouting stuff in Spanish at our building. They see me, start flipping me off and whatnot before they suddenly scatter in all directions. Then bam, a brick lands right in the spot where they were before they scattered. See, that's the type of guy Hector was. He could go out for a pack of rips and find himself in a brick fight with a bunch of Puerto Rican kids on the way back. Never in my life have I ever had a fight with a preteen, let alone one involving projectiles. But around Hector, that stuff was like a daily occurrence. So come that October, Hector is headed out on some big Halloween tour with one of his bands and he tells me he won't be back till the second week of November. That meant I'd have to cover half of the rent until then, something I'd have to borrow money to do. This causes a big fight and for the first time since I moved in, I thought Hector might actually hit me. And being the kind of guy that he was, I knew for a fact that if it came to violence, he wouldn't just stop at one punch. So when the time came for him to go on tour, the mood in the apartment isn't just at its low point. I'm legit scared for my physical safety. He leaves, I'm looking for a new apartment and life is not so good anymore. So a few nights later, the night before Halloween actually, I'm sitting in the little kitchen area, eating arepas and looking for other apartments. Someone buzzes the apartment, so I go to see who it is. This is back when we had intercoms, but they sucked and barely worked half the time, so when I hear some guy with an accent says something like, I need an apartment number three, but the buzzer's not working. I just buzz the guy in without a second thought. New York is a city built on takeout, delivery, and street food, so I'm hardly going to be all suspicious over a delivery driver. But I should have been, and I almost paid with my life for it. Those guys busted our front door open like it was nothing, just smashed the lock right through with a sledgehammer. I actually thought it was the cops at first because they just piled in, guns drawn, 
shouting, get on the floor, get down. But then the way that they were talking to each other once I was lying face down on the linoleum, that clued me into the fact that they were just stick-up guys. But what were they doing in my apartment? My first thought was, Jesus Christ, Hector, whose toes do you step on now? But before I can wonder any more, one of the guys starts asking me, where is it? Where is it? I'm like, where's what? But that just makes them mad. I get this flurry of kicks that have me balled up in the fetal position, then they ask me again. I can't tell them anything else, so I just say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. There's $20 in my wallet. That's all I got on me. The offer of 20 bucks just offended them, and I get more kicks before they start tossing the apartment like they're looking for something. And when I say tossing, I really do mean trashing. They're deliberately breaking stuff, pulling drawers all the way out and then throwing them at other stuff. It was just destruction in every sense of the word, and it was around then that I got a look at a couple of the guys. They're all messed up or have stuff over their faces. They're wearing all black, gloves, and the works. They were professional stick-up guys, probably robbed drug dealers for a living, but Hector wasn't dealing. I mean, I think I'd have noticed at some point. I saw a lot of broken guitars and amplifiers around the apartment, but not too many piles of coke or money. Then right as I'm about to think it, one of the guys comes out with it. You sure this is the right place, man? Uh, I don't know. Only told me he keeps it behind the bathtub sometimes, but these people only got a shower in there. I feel this wave of relief washing over me. They got the wrong place, so they're gonna just walk out, right? Maybe take my phone so I can't call the cops. So, like I said, I told them my phone was on the table, next to my food, and that I wouldn't call the cops if they just left. Cuck move, maybe, but it's amazing how zen you get about material possessions when you see a Glock in someone's hand. The stick-up guys kind of pause and look at each other. Then right as I think they're about to just leave, one of them says, I think you see my face, man, when we were breaking in. He's gotta go. One of them has the gun, and the guy who wants me dead starts reaching to take it off the guy who has it, but the guy who has it doesn't want to give it up. That was my cue, to soil myself and start begging for my life. It wasn't my proudest moment, and peeing my pants was by no means metaphorical, but it is what it is looking back. They're arguing over shooting me. I'm begging for my life. It's just chaos and them shouting in there and and I'm amazed no one had called the cops already. But then boom. The front entrance of the apartment building slammed shut and I can hear a very familiar voice coming up the stairs. I'm not even going to type out what Hector was saying. I'd be cancelled and deleted from the internet within seconds after posting but let's just say someone had cancelled their tour three days in and he was livid about it. Going on calling them every name under the sun ranting and raving as he pound his way up the stairs, and in the apartment, both me and the stick-up guys are about frozen in anticipation. Then right as Hector is about to come into the apartment, he says something like, Hey, I got your money, you whiny little baby. What the f- The guy with the gun aims it at Hector as he walks in, looking around at the pure destruction that greeted him. Who are you people? He screamed. Who are you? The guy with the gun screamed back. Hector is just gone by this point, foaming at the mouth, looking like he's got one of his eyeballs about to pop when he comes back. I live here! Then, I swear to God, I watch as Hector basically turns into a drunk, slightly overweight Jason Bourne. He swings his backpack off his shoulder and just launches it at the shooter. He knocks the guy slightly off balance, messes up his aim, but by the time he can like rearrange himself, Hector like football tackles this guy onto the carpet and just starts wailing on him. The two other guys then jump in and I'm thinking, oh Jesus God, someone's about to get shot. When out of nowhere, Hector comes up and is just windmailing punches at both guys, holding his own until he goes down again. Then almost immediately, both guys start backing up, hands in the air, and there's Hector, holding the gun he'd almost just been shot with, telling both the guys to back up. His face is bleeding. He's totally gassed, but 
There he is, having just won a freaking fist fight with three guys, one of them armed. He then sits on the KO'd shooter's back, tells the other guys to get out of his apartment, and tells me to dial 911. And only when the cops show up to arrest the guy he'd managed to detain did he realize he'd been stabbed in the shoulder. That night, as he got stitched up at the hospital, I sifted through all the broken and non-broken stuff, swept up all the broken glass and ceramics, and generally tried to put the apartment back in order. He got back at around 1am, still drunk after the doctor told him, do not drink on these painkillers, and immediately started complaining about the break-in. I just carried on cleaning up, stopping only briefly to say something deeply heartfelt. Hector, dude... I just wanted to say I think you might have saved my life today, dude. And I just wanted to say thank you. I felt my throat kind of tighten as I said it. Very similar to the way it's doing now as I'm typing this, remembering. Hector looked up at me, with this look in his eyes that almost made it look like I'd gotten through to him. Until he replied with, Whatever, you could have jumped in at any time. <sighs> I didn't mind. I knew Hector well enough by that point to know he wasn't exactly in touch with his feelings. But as he immediately sought to leave the room due to the uncomfortable amount of emotion in the air, he turned and said, Did you see the look on those guys' faces, though? It's hilarious, dude. And he just walked off to his bedroom, laughing that evil toddler laugh that makes my skin crawl, even today. You see... For just over a year, I shared an apartment with the biggest idiot on the face of the earth. And I owe that idiot my life. Please, New York, don't ever change. We've lived in our neighborhood for nearly four years. A few houses down and across the street is a Filipino family. They're pretty nice, and whenever we see each other, we always have small talk, and we know each other by name. We moved in right before I gave birth to my oldest, so they always ask for the baby, and they love seeing them. We have even had meals at each other's homes before. This summer, they had an older family member, maybe 55 to 60 years old, come to visit. We noticed him right away because he would always go for long walks and lingered a lot. One evening, the mother of the family introduced him as her father. He had recently moved and would be staying with them for a while before heading north to her sister's house. He was pretty new to the US and spoke a little English, just enough to get by. He seemed nice enough, but as soon as we walked inside, I told my husband that he gave me a really weird vibe. I had never felt that way of any of the seven other family members from the home. I've been in their home and shared meals with them. They're very sweet and welcoming. My husband also told me that he did seem a little off, but we just chalked it up to cultural differences. Fast forward about a month. My mother-in-law and my mother came to visit at the very same time. They're in the driveway with our son. I run inside because I'm pregnant and I suffer from severe morning sickness. I come back out 15 minutes later and they're having a frustrating conversation with this man. He was trying to get one of them to drive him to the store and he would use a food stamp slash EBD card to buy their groceries and wanted them to give him cash. They both told him that they weren't interested but he just kept asking and lingering. When I went outside I called out to my husband to come out and when he saw us he walked away very quickly. Both of our mothers told us what had happened and how forceful that he was being with them. The next few days that I see him walking, we always wave and say simple pleasantries, but every time I would wave, he would take it as a sign to come over and try to have a conversation. I began to let him know that what he did with our mothers is very illegal and to be so forceful was really unnecessary. He said that he understood, but he would linger. It would always be at a moment where I was trying to strap my toddler to his car seat and I was rushing to get him to school. It would always take me about 10 minutes to get him to get the hint that I couldn't talk and he would slowly walk away and just linger in our driveway. It eventually got to the point where I would watch to see if he had walked past our house on his morning walk before venturing outside. 
I really just hated the awkward conversation. He would always seem to round the corner just as I finished strapping my son in the car and I was getting in. I would wave and then jump in quickly and drive off. It just felt really off, like he was waiting for me. One of our neighbors across the street one night told me that she got a weird vibe from him as well. And again, he always lingered. She told me that he did similar things with her when they were outside as well. They were opting to hang in the backyard with the kids just to avoid it altogether. Now, I usually work from home, but one day I went into the office and I was then alerted by the ring camera. This man was standing and looking in through our kitchen window, just peering, and I could hear our pit bull barking at him. When he saw our dog, he jumped back and I used the microphone to say, Can I help you? What do you want? He looked absolutely shocked and then scurried away. I called my husband and I told him to play the video. We both thought it was really creepy. Whenever we saw the family walking that evening, we decided to bring it up to his daughter. She spoke to her father and he claimed that it never happened. We then showed her the video on her phone and he said that he must have gotten lost. The daughter seemed pretty annoyed by him and the entire situation. So, him being weird kind of calmed down a bit after that I could see that his daughter was really annoyed by his behavior, and as they were walking, there was a really heated conversation. She later told me that he tends to be overly friendly and he really means no harm, but she talked to him and he would leave us alone. I asked if he had some kind of mental issue or maybe Alzheimer's since he was always getting lost. She told me no and that he had always acted like that and that she couldn't wait until her sister was ready for him to be sent up north to her. There were a few other neighbors that had also complained to her and the homeowners association as well. Well, about two months later, I drop my son off to preschool. I get home and I have to rush in because I feel really sick. Usually I leave my car door open but something told me to lock it as soon as I got out. I did so as I was rushing inside. I would also normally leave the door unlocked if I was just going for a quick throw up session, but again, my instincts told me to lock the bottom and top lock. When I was in the bathroom, right by the front door throwing up my life, I then hear a rattling at the front door. Someone is turning the lock back and forth. Of course, my ring chimes and I then look at it in between heaves. What do you know? It's the old man and he's trying to get into our home. I go over to the microphone and then say, You're at the wrong house. To which he responds with, Let me in, now. I want to tell you something. Now, I kid you not, it was the best English sentence I had ever heard from someone who wasn't that good with English. I started to feel better pretty quickly and I was now on high alert. I responded with, What do you want to tell me? He looked right at the camera. Let me in your house, now! This is where I started to panic. He knew he was at the wrong house, but still he was continuing to try and break in. I respond. Please get off my property. I don't feel comfortable with you here, and I'm not letting you in my house. He then starts rattling at the door again really hard and tries to pull it open, and then starts knocking on the bathroom window. This is where I get pissed. Get the hell off my damn property right now. I'm not going to let you in. If you don't get the hell out of here right now, I'm calling the cops. He then steps back, gives the camera the middle finger, and scurries off. He disappears and I run upstairs and see that he's simply walking back to his house. I let our pit bull out of our bedroom as he had been going crazy during this whole ordeal. I call my husband and he tells me to call the daughter and tell her what happened. I call her and I tell her what happened and she told me not to let him in, ever. She began to warn me that he's been very inappropriate and forceful with all of the women in her family and she didn't want me to get hurt, especially being pregnant. She eventually comes over about an hour later and I show her the video. She's absolutely fuming over this and very apologetic and she begs me not to call the cops. She promises me he'll be gone within the next day. 
The next day, he eventually flies out and his daughter told him that he's no longer welcome in her home. He now lives up north somewhere in Maryland with his other daughter and probably harassing other people as well. I honestly really don't know what would have happened if I didn't follow my instincts that day. I'm just really glad I'm okay. The story happened to me when I was in third grade. I was about eight years old at the time. My regular babysitter was ill, so my mom asked one of our neighbors who had kids and babysit a lot of the neighborhood kids if she would watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house when my mom came to pick us up. I asked if I could stay a little bit longer and finish Madagascar as we had just started watching it. She said that it was fine, but I was to walk straight home right after. It was like maybe half a block, so not that far at all. So as the movie finishes, Brandy said that I needed to get home really fast because it was dark out. As I'm walking home, this other neighbor, Dennis, is just standing outside in his front yard. Now, I had seen Dennis around the neighborhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They have a daughter that was like maybe four-ish at the time, so I didn't ever play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighborhood. Dennis starts calling out to me, saying, Hey, what are you doing? I'm just going to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a little bit? No, that's okay. My mom told me to come straight home. Aw, oh, come on. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Uh, no thanks. Come on. I have a daughter who would absolutely love to play with you. We can even make snacks. At this point, I was just like... Red flag, abort mission, and I started booking it home really fast. Then he starts following me. Not quickly, just kind of walking like Michael Myers. It was creepy. Luckily, I eventually made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light on, he completely backed off. I'd like to mention that behind our houses was a giant wooded area with paths that led to a nearby lake. So, I mean, this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something. I try not to think like that, but like, what other motives could he have had, you know? Fast forward until I'm in high school and working at a restaurant in town. I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. As it turns out, they were secret shoppers at our restaurant. I don't think he really recognized me working there, though. Anyways... I know this isn't your typical horror story of someone getting dragged into the woods, but still, as a child, this was a very creepy experience to go through. If you're a young child walking home alone, always watch your surroundings. You just never know. So, about a year ago, my apartment complex decided that they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and my rent is pretty ridiculous here, so I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I really love. I posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent pretty soon and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner. I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit, and he asked if he could text me some pictures that his neighbor took because the chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel really stupid for doing this, but eventually gave him my phone number. I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. Now, I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone, so I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person then said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? Huh? It really took me by surprise and I didn't really know what to say. He started to just shoot the crap on the phone, talking about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day. I finally interrupted and then said, So, about the condo? He pretty much completely disregarded that and then said, I really don't think that my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you, but I don't have to tell her, right? 
I said that I have to go and then immediately hung up the phone. And as soon as I did, he then started texting me. It was really bizarre and quite alarming to me. I blocked his number and then moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. Now, I'm 32 years old, but it was really creepy to me, and I even called my parents to tell them about it, and just how unnerved that it made me. And the worst part about it is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. So, I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible in my profile, but I checked, and sure enough, my address and unit number were totally public. Unable to really contact me in any other way, he started messaging me again on Nextdoor, asking me if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't really block or report people on the app, so I just decided to delete it. So one night about a month or so later, I had a knock on my door at around 10 p.m. on a weeknight. I looked out my peephole but couldn't really get a good look. I saw that it was a man who slightly had his head down. Either way, I don't answer the door for anyone that I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 o'clock at night. Feeling panicked, I decided to call my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman and we always look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was some kind of delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to try and get a good look at the guy and that spooked him because he literally ran away. I honestly have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me that it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt that I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know that my address was visible on next door. I'll never be that casual or lazy about privacy settings like that ever again. I'm 28 years old, but when I was about 5 years old, my mom and I lived in this duplex that was off a main road and kind of in a wooded area. We lived on one side and the other was a woman and her son. He was studying to be a teacher. My mother had me pretty young, so she was about 25 years old and the guy was in his early 20s. He would often come and talk to my mom. My mother said that he would ask a lot of questions about me and ask my mother if it would be alright for him to take me for walks in the woods. Of course, my mother always declined. My mother worked in the operating room at the local hospital and was on call a lot, so most of the weekends I stayed at my grandma's house. One night while I was at my grandma's house, my mom was home alone, sleeping. She woke in the middle of the night and said she doesn't remember if she heard something or felt someone in the room, but she woke up. She could see feet wearing socks that were sticking out from the end of her bed. She grabbed her bedside lamp and was about to hit the intruder when our neighbor then yelled her name and then said his name. He couldn't really explain why he was naked and only wearing socks, but he begged my mother not to tell his mother about it. My mother of course called the cops. She ended up going to court and making a victim impact statement against this guy because she was absolutely terrified that he'd become a teacher and be around children. She says that she's pretty sure that he was there for me that night and was so happy that I wasn't there. We ended up moving pretty much immediately after that happened. She just couldn't stay another night in that house. I'm just really glad that nothing happened to me or my mother. Who really knows what would have happened if he would have succeeded in whatever he was trying to do that night. This happened to me back when I was around 12 years old. I was going through some of my old cringy notebooks and journals with my girlfriend, and I found my old journal entry where I wrote about this day, and all the memories came flooding back to me. I used to live in what I thought was a really safe and secure private community. I wasn't allowed to just wander around too far from home without supervision, but because our neighborhood was a gated community, my parents would let me walk around within the gates anytime that I wanted, even if they weren't home. One day I was riding around the neighborhood after school when I saw a middle-aged woman crying on the floor of her porch with the front door wide open. I was pretty concerned and got off my bike to see what was wrong. She said that she was having problems with her husband and immediately asked me to come in so I could keep her company while she calmed down. 
my stranger danger sirens were completely going off, so I declined. She kept pushing me. Please, please, just for a moment. I just need someone to talk to. Now, I was raised to always respect elders and to be a good person, but I was also raised to know about stranger danger. So, being a young, naive kid, I actually felt pretty conflicted about whether I should go in or not. Ultimately, I declined repeatedly enough that she instead asked me to wait outside with her and then sit with her until she felt better. I agreed to this, since I felt very safe in my own neighborhood. She asked me to wait on the porch for her while she walked into the house and visibly grabbed a couple of framed pictures from off the wall. She then sat down next to me inside the house while I was sitting on the porch just outside of her door. She then started showing me the pictures. One was of a kid older than me in the local high school football uniform, and the other of a man and the same kid. She went on to tell me these stories about how she met him and how they spent their honeymoon in Hawaii, and how her kid was so good at football, one of the best on his team. She was very worried that if her and her husband got a divorce, she wouldn't be able to see her kid anymore. And then she started bawling again, this time onto my shoulder. This actually caused me to let my guard down quite a bit. For some reason, once I knew she had a kid, I felt a bit more comfortable around her. She was talking for a while though, and I was beginning to start to feel a little awkward as she was on and off crying on my shoulder, and I didn't know how to react in the situation. What the heck did I get myself into? I kept thinking to myself as I nodded my head pretending to listen. I was more concerned about finding a good excuse to tell her I had to go home. She kept calling me such a young nice boy and telling me, you have no idea how important it is for you to spend your time with me, which made me feel a little bad about just leaving her. She kept telling me that she wanted to reward me and make me some dinner if I just came in, which I continued to decline. Finally, I told her I had to go, and she asked me if I knew anything about how to turn on her cell phone, as she just got her first cell phone very recently. I told her I did and I could help her out before I left. She told me to wait yet again, and this time left for quite a while. I kept thinking I should just walk away, but part of me didn't want to be rude, especially since she lived right around the corner from my house and possibly even knew my parents. My anxiety levels would spike as I got closer and closer in my head to convincing myself to just stand up and walk away. Then it would just dissipate and I'd tell myself, no, I can't just leave. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she brought me her phone, which was an Android. I had only had an iPhone 3G at the time, and it was my first smartphone, so I was a little worried that I wouldn't know how it worked. I just held the power button down for a second, and lo and behold, it booted right up. She asked me then if I knew how to check text messages. I found and opened up the messages app, and there was only one number not saved as a contact in the app. She then pointed to it and said, That's him. That's my husband's number. Read me his text. I opened it up. She had received basically the same text over and over again, just multiple variations on hello and please respond. She angrily said to me, read them to me right now, I want to know what he said to me. I then tell her, they basically all just say hello with a question mark. She just reaffirmed in a stern voice, read them to me. I started reading them, hello, hello, please respond. She just has her eyes closed and she's nodding sometimes, commenting with things along the lines of, That jerk, he does miss me. Well, screw him. He had his chance. She then turned quickly from this crying distraught woman who was worried about her husband leaving her into an angry and spiteful person who felt like she was in the right. There was a couple of times when I stopped reading and I would ask if she wanted me to stop and she would just snap at me. Keep reading. Then I would continue. I started to feel like her husband was a crazy person with this many messages. I must have scrolled and read dozens of messages almost identical, spanning back days. My heart was racing. I felt like I was involved in something I shouldn't be involved in. I really wanted to go home, but every time I stopped, she would get really angry and tell me to keep going. That's when I came across the very first message that wasn't hello. Stop messaging me, you crazy woman. Leave me alone. I've reported you to the police and got a restraining order. If you come anywhere near my family, you will be arrested. My heart sank. That's when I realized all the messages I had been reading so far were being sent from her phone. 
I paused in shock, and she again snapped at me. Keep reading. I told her I couldn't because it was getting very late and my parents had dinner for me. She again just said, Why don't you just come in for dinner? I'll make you something. You can let them know later you are helping your neighbor. They won't be mad, I promise. Only this time she was a mixture of angry and desperate. I told her they would be worried and wonder why I was gone for so long. She pleaded a couple more times for me to not leave her, and she started crying as I stood up. Honestly, I felt really bad about it at the time. I rode my bike home as quickly as I could. My parents had just gotten home from work a little while ago and asked me where I was. I didn't tell them the truth because honestly I was a little worried that they wouldn't let me hang around the neighborhood when they weren't home anymore. A few days later I came home and there were three police cars out in front of her house. My heart sank. I asked my parents later that night if they knew what had happened. My dad just said, oh there was just a break in or something. I later asked one of my neighbors to see if I could get some more information about what happened. Apparently one of my neighbors fell in love with a homeless woman after inviting her in for a shower and a place to stay. He got her some new clothes and a phone and was trying to help her get a job. Turns out the reason she was homeless was because she suffered from mental illness. He then kicked her out when she started having delusions of his kid from a previous marriage being her kid as well. Honestly, he sounds like a really crappy person. She began harassing him after this, so he left the house to his parents' house and then sent the kid to his ex-wife's house. Apparently, he was worried for his ex-wife and his kid's safety. He had every right to because shortly after he left, she broke a rear window of his house and then came in. She had been living in the house for nearly a week before a neighbor noticed the broken window and called the police. She apparently trashed the whole house by that point and was arrested. I almost didn't believe it, but I went behind the house and saw the broken window. I guess the guy broke his lease and moved out immediately because he was worried she would come back after getting out of jail. I don't know if she ever did try and come back, but I really hope they disclose this to the new tenants. Honestly, I still get pretty freaked out to this day. Who knows what would have happened if I went into that house. About five years ago, when I was 16, I was living in western Pennsylvania in a heavily forested area. On this particular night, I was home alone with my younger brother, while my mom was out at a baby shower. I was in the kitchen making dinner for myself when I heard a knocking on the front porch. This wasn't a common knock, like someone might be waiting for me to open the door. It was more like a few loud taps close to one of the front windows. I paused and glanced around. From where I stood in the kitchen, I could see the front door and one of the front windows. All the lights on the ground floor were on and with it being dark outside, all I could see in the windows was a reflection of the inside of my living room. I waited for a few moments, but when the sound didn't come again, I shrugged it off and continued concentrating on the stove. After maybe five minutes, long enough for me to forget about the sound, it repeated itself, this time from the front window at the far side of the house. Mark? I called out, thinking it might have been my brother. There was no response. I walked over to the front of the house and peered outside with my hands pressed to the side of my face, but I couldn't see anything. I turned as my brother came down the stairs. Did you just hear something from around back? He said. I held up a finger to indicate that we should pause and listen, and almost on cue, we heard footsteps calmly walking across the wooden floor of our wraparound porch, just outside the dining room wall. There's someone out there, I said quietly more angry than scared. It was at this point that we should have locked all the doors and called out the window that we were calling the cops, but I was a stupid headstrong kid and pissed off that someone was messing with us. I remember my brother asking if the person outside was trying to distract us, but I was already at the gun cabinet. I should point out that I was raised with guns and I knew how to properly handle one. I pulled out the 9mm from the drawer and loaded it. I'm going to scare him off. I told my brother, lock the front door behind me. Before I could even give him a chance to argue, I was marching to the door with a gun in my hands. I threw open the door and stepped out into the porch. My brother then flicked on the outside lights, and right there, about eight feet in front of me, was a sickly thin guy wearing a hoodie with light blue eyes and a soul patch on his chin. He had been in the process of stepping onto the porch, 
but the moment he saw me, he spun around and ran like a bat out of hell. I took off running a few yards after him, then stopped, pointed my gun in the air, and fired off a shot. That's right, fuck off! I cried out. I waited until he disappeared into the trees before turning around to face the house. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that for a few moments my heart stopped. I felt that momentary wave of ice water through my veins, and the painful thudding of my heart in my chest as it tried to correct its rhythm. There was at least eight other people standing around my porch, and a handful more scattered around the yard. They were mostly men, but there was also at least two women, all dressed in dark jackets and hoodies, looking mostly like they were in their early twenties. None of them said anything, instead they all just stared at me, their hands mostly in their pockets, and I couldn't tell if any of them had weapons, then they all just scattered. Some jogged away, but most of them just walked off in different directions out into the woods. I legitimately forgot for a handful of seconds that I was holding a gun, until I raised my hands to my face and felt its weight. I sprinted back to the front door and pounded on it until my brother let me back in. I had no idea what to tell him. I had just fired a gun up into the air and none of them had cried out or made any sound whatsoever. Had they had been drunk or something and were trying to pull a prank, they would have said something. They would have been like, Whoa, sorry man, wrong house, put down the gun. But all they did was just look at me, like I had just ruined their surprise attack. And more disappointed than scared, they all just wandered off. I had no idea what to make of it. My brother turned on all the lights in the house and called the cops, who to their credit arrived within 10 minutes and swept the perimeter. There were footprints everywhere, and they asked my brother and I numerous times if we had just had a party. I kept telling them a dozen or more people had just been loitering around our house in the darkness, but the cops didn't seem to take it that seriously. They asked if the strangers had threatened us, and I had to admit that they didn't in any direct way. They confiscated the handgun after I told them that I fired off a round, but they eventually returned it. I have no idea to this day what those people were doing that night outside of our house. My brother suspects that they were part of some kind of cult, and maybe have been setting up to perform some kind of ritual, and maybe that we were set to be human sacrifices. I thought it more likely they intended to break in and rob us, but saw the gun and bailed. That doesn't explain the silence though. None of them uttered so much as a sound as they looked at me and just, as if instructed by some signal, scattered all at once. I've read that during alleged UFO sightings, people can become hypnotized by lights that appear above them, and they wake up hours later in entirely new locations having no idea what happened or how they got there. I can't dismiss that kind of possibility. They all seem to be hypnotized. That group of people has never returned and I haven't even caught a glimpse of anyone I recognized from that night in town. We bought a dog not long after. Six years ago, I worked as a delivery driver for Domino's. For me, it was a pretty easy job to just drive around town delivering pizzas, plus I made some pretty good tips. I lived in the city, so I would never have to drive all that far. This was also my main way of earning extra money during my summers home from college, and I would generally work some pretty late nights. One night, I remember that it was a Friday, which are always really busy. I was driving all over the place around town for hours, until finally it started to quiet down after midnight. At about one o'clock in the morning, we got another order for a delivery that I took. It was one cheese pizza and an order of cheesy bread, and I put it in my car and started driving. Once I got closer to the location, I realized that it was not for a house, but a business. It was still in the city, but a more industrial side of town where there appeared to be a bunch of warehouses. I arrived at the address and saw that the special instructions on the order said that they wanted it delivered to the back door in the alley. I drove around back to find a dark alley with some dumpsters and then a small set of concrete stairs that seemed to lead to the building. I drove around back to find a dark alley with some dumpsters and then a small set of concrete stairs that led to a back door of the building. I'm not going to lie, it was a creepy scene with no other cars or people there in a back alley in the middle of the night. I had a job to do though, and I got out of my car and walked up the steps to the back door. I knocked on the door and waited there for a minute, but nobody answered. It was extremely quiet, and nobody else seemed to be around at all. 
I was beginning to wonder if I was at the correct building, so I looked around for the address to make sure. But just then, I heard a noise come from about 10 feet away from me. I looked and saw a man come from behind a dumpster that was sitting on the other side of the stairs that I was on. He was wearing sunglasses even though it was night and started walking towards me. Based on the way he was walking, it didn't seem good and I backed away from my car. Then I saw another man come out from behind the other side of my car. He was also in sunglasses, but other than that, I couldn't really give a good description. They both were coming towards me at a pretty fast paced walk. I knew I wouldn't be able to get to my car, so I jumped over the railing of the stairs to the ground below, which was only about five feet. I then ran out of the alley as fast as I could. I could hear the men chasing after me as I did, and it sounded like there was a third person among them running as well. I was somehow able to outrun them to the end of the alley, and once I was there, I turned for the street and tried to run to an area where there was more people. I panicked and ran into the middle of the road, where a car was coming and started honking at me. I got out of the way just in time, and was lucky enough to get to the other side of the street. The men stopped from chasing me and were still at the other side. From there, I called my boss and told him what happened. I made my way to a nearby convenience store and waited. It ended up being a big deal, as the building that I was instructed to deliver the pizza to had not actually ordered the pizza, meaning whoever lured me there was possibly setting me up to get robbed or something like that. The police were called, and I quit the job shortly after. This happened about a year ago. It was a Friday night, and I was hanging out with my girlfriend at her place, and we were trying to decide what movie we were going to watch. We ordered Domino's, some pasta and a pepperoni pizza, and I offered to go pick it up. There was a Domino's roughly five minutes away, so it wasn't a big deal for me to drive over and get it, and then I wouldn't have to spend money on a tip. When the food said it was done, I got in my car and left. I got to the small restaurant, which by this time was roughly 11 p.m. and was pretty quiet. I parked in the small parking lot beside the restaurant and walked inside. There was nobody at the counter as I walked in, so I stood there and waited. After a few seconds, I saw a woman briefly come out from the kitchen area and said she would be right with me in a moment, then she disappeared again away from the counter. I said that was fine and I stood there waiting. I looked around the small lobby. I wasn't in a big hurry or anything so I didn't mind and I knew that it being a Friday night they were probably really busy with deliveries. Then as I looked behind me at the window going outside, I saw a man who had his face pressed up against the glass window of the store looking right at me. He had a scraggly beard and appeared to be in his 30s. He was just staring at me with a somewhat angry look on his face. I didn't know what to do and just turned back around. I was expecting him to come inside the store, but he never did. I faced the counter and then looked over my shoulder again to see that he was still there and not moving. Finally, the woman came back and asked me for my name of the order. As she did, she seemed to see the man in the window and asked who he was. I said I didn't know and I found it strange. She kind of laughed it off with a nervous and awkward laugh. Then I told her my name and she said she would go get my order. As she was getting it, I could see movement out of the corner of my eye. I saw the man suddenly dart away from the window and run away. I figured he was just some crazy guy and I was glad that he was gone. A minute or so later, the woman came back with my order and I took the boxes and left Domino's. I walked to the parking lot on the side where my car was and saw that the weird guy from the window was now standing by my car. I felt really awkward now because this man seemed to be a little crazy and I knew I'd have to walk right past him. I was also concerned with him being right next to my car. I slowly walked over and the man looked at me and smiled as I did. He didn't come closer to me though, which was a relief. Eventually, I was able to make it to my driver's door and get inside. I said goodnight to the man and drove away. He just stood there smiling at me. I began driving the five minute or so drive back home, but as I pulled onto a busier road less than a mile later, my car suddenly didn't feel right. The front wheel seemed like it was coming right off. I stopped the car on the side of the road and got out. I walked over and looked to see that all the lug nuts on my right front wheel were loosened almost all the way and the wheel of the car was starting to come off. I couldn't believe it. I immediately thought back to the man. I was kind of more out in the middle of nowhere now and was driving away from the businesses in town. I got out my phone and quickly called my girlfriend. I got back inside my car then and waited for her. 
Luckily, she could come and pick me up with her car, and she arrived just a couple of short minutes later, and we went over to get a wrench. We were gone for only about 10 minutes, but when we got back, my driver's window was smashed. At that point, we called the police. They came out to the area and we told them the whole story. I believe that man I saw was trying to hurt me, and he returned to my car and smashed the window after he realized I was gone. I'm grateful that I narrowly missed him. A few years ago, I worked at Domino's Pizza. I worked there for roughly one year, and for the most part, I liked it. One time, though, I was working a night shift like I often did. It was sort of busy, and we would typically get a lot of phone calls for pizza orders, and I would answer them a lot of the times. On this night, we got another phone call at about 10 p.m. I answered it, but on the other end, I didn't hear anything at all. I said hello several times, but there was just silence. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, I heard on the other end a loud and really creepy sounding laugh. I said hello one more time, and when I did, the laugh only seemed to get louder. It gave me the creeps and I hung up on them. I kept working and answered several more calls over the next few hours, until after midnight I got another call which was the same creepy laugh. I asked who it was, but of course they didn't answer. This time I kept them on for a little bit longer but all they would do is laugh. Eventually, I hung up on them again, and that was the last call I got that night. Over the next few days, though, it started happening more often. It happened about five times, and I told my coworkers about it. They hadn't experienced anything like it, and it would only seem to happen when I answered the phone. I was starting to get really annoyed and also seriously creeped out by these calls that kept happening. The person on the other end of the phone was usually laughing, but sometimes there would be a whisper which I couldn't make out what they were saying. Then they started just doing other random things like not talking at all or hanging up right away. I figured it was just a stupid prank, but I couldn't help but be a little bit scared. Then things got even worse. One night, when I was at home, I received a call, and when I answered it, I heard that same creepy laughing. I had no idea how they got my number because it had only happened at work. I asked who it was once again, but all I heard was the same old laughing. Then they started whispering once again, and I couldn't make it out at all. Eventually, they hung up on me. I was really creeped out now, and didn't know what to do. I was home by myself, so that made me worry even more. I ended up calling my best friend and telling her all about it. She came over that night, but there were no more calls. The next night, I got the last call that I ever received from that person. It was more hysterical laughing, and it got louder and louder, until finally, there was a scream at the other end of the phone, and they hung up. This time, I was the most creeped out that I had ever been, and once again, my best friend came over. She spent the next few nights at my place, however, that was the last call that I ever got from the number, and they never called me again at work or at home. I sometimes wonder who it was, and why they were calling me. I go to Taco Bell all the time. Most of the time that I go, it's during the late nights. I'm a senior in college, and I'm always busy with work and school. For the last few years, I've often drove to the Taco Bell drive through after long nights of work or studying. One night, about two months ago now, I was really hungry at about 11.30 p.m. when I got done with work. I drove to the nearest Taco Bell, which was about 10 minutes away, and pulled into the drive through this particular Taco Bell location was open until midnight every night of the week, but it recently had been closing early on some nights because they had been short in employees. As I pulled into the drive through without really thinking, I noticed nobody else was in the drive through and the lights to the restaurant seemed to be off. I knew they closed the lobby of the restaurant earlier than the drive through so I wasn't really sure if they were still open or not. I drove to the speaker and rolled down my window. I didn't hear anybody on the other side and there was a few seconds of silence. I said, hey, are you guys still open? And waited for a response. Several seconds more went by and still there was nothing. I knew at this point they must have been closed and I started to roll up my window when I heard something from the other end. There was a man's voice speaking, 
but I couldn't understand anything that he said. It sounded like when you have your mouth way too close to the phone and you can't understand any of the words. I asked them to repeat what they had said, but there was once again no response. This time I decided to just drive away and go somewhere else. I pulled slowly through the rest of the drive through As I got to the first drive through window, I could see that there was nobody there and the lights inside were off. Then I saw the second window and the lights were off as well, but there appeared to be a man in the window looking at me. As I passed by the window, I watched him quickly duck down as if he didn't want me to notice him. It was strange, but another thing struck me as being even more weird. The man was wearing what appeared to be a clown mask covering his entire head. I drove over to a nearby gas station and got food there instead. The next night, I found myself in a similar situation of getting off work later at night and was once again really craving Taco Bell. It was only 10.30 this time though, so I decided to go back and see if they were open. When I arrived, I could see there were several cars in the drive-thru already, and so I pulled in. They were in fact open, and I was waiting in the line until it was my turn. I ordered, and when I got to the window to pay, I asked if they had changed their hours. The woman working told me no, they had not changed their hours, and they had just closed at 9 the previous night due to a short staff. I mentioned how I had seen a man inside the window with a clown mask on at almost midnight, and the woman seemed surprised. She told me she had closed the place herself and left at 9 o'clock, and when she did, nobody else was there. When I drove home that night, I couldn't help but wonder who it was that I had seen the night before in the window. I used to work at Taco Bell in the past. I worked at a Taco Bell that was about 15 minutes away from my parents' house. I worked there for a few years from my senior year of high school through my first two years of college. I liked the job a lot and made lots of friends. But with working late nights, I would occasionally see some weird things. But the strangest thing to ever happen was my last year working there. The Taco Bell location that I worked at was open until 3 a.m and I would often be closing as I was on this particular night. I worked mostly just during the summer, so I didn't mind it too much. There was just the two of us working at the time. We usually didn't get too many customers this late, unless it was a weekend, and being a Thursday night, it was pretty dead for the last couple of hours. At about 2.55 a.m., literally right before we were about to close it down and go home, I saw a car pull into the drive-thru. As we were still open for five more minutes technically, I decided to not tell them that we were closed and take one last order. I spoke to the driver and asked what his order would be. I waited for a response for a while, but there was none. As I looked at the camera at the car, it appeared to still have the window rolled up. I waited a little while longer and was starting to get really annoyed because I wanted to go home and now I had to wait for this person to order. Finally, I saw the driver's window roll down, but it looked like there was nobody inside the car at all. The driver's seat was just empty. Nobody was in the passenger seat either, and I was really confused. I decided to say to the driver that we would be closing, and if they wanted to order anything, they would have to do it right now. I didn't get any response. Instead, after about 10 or 15 seconds, the car just drove forward slowly ahead. I was so confused as to what was going on. How was the car driving if there was nobody in the driver's seat? I shook my head and then told Damien that they didn't order anything, so we could close it up. Just then, we heard the sound of knocking coming from the drive through window. It was three loud and solid knocks. I walked over to the window and saw that the same car had stopped at it. I opened up the window and looked out, but saw that there was nobody in the car once again. The front window was down, and there was nobody in the driver's seat or the passenger. I thought it had to somehow be a prank. I stuck my head out of the window to get a better look inside the car and saw that there was nobody in the back seats as well. My jaw dropped and I couldn't believe what was going on. I got a creepy feeling and stuck my head back inside and closed the drive through window. I then watched as the car drove away. Damien and I were both extremely puzzled by this. We closed up after that and both went home. I don't remember anything else as strange ever happening. This story happened about five years ago. 
I was on a road trip with my friend Anna. We had been driving all day, and late at night we both got really hungry. By this time it was nearly midnight, so as I drove, Anna looked on her phone for places nearby that were open. We were kind of in the middle of nowhere and unfamiliar with the area. As we drove on the freeway, it was pretty much just fields on both sides. Anna was saying that her phone was really slow and she wasn't really getting a signal out here. We kept on driving for about 20 more minutes until we finally saw an exit sign with several food places on it. We pulled off the exit and quickly saw that the only places that seemed to be open were a gas station and a little Taco Bell. There were several other buildings in the small town, but all of their lights were off. We first stopped for some gas and then pulled into the Taco Bell drive through We got to the speaker to place our order and as I was beginning to talk, I heard what sounded like a scream coming in the background. It sounded like someone was screaming help, but it abruptly got cut off. After a few seconds of silence, a man's voice came back on to say that they were closed. Anna and I both found this very bizarre, and we had a strange feeling about it, so we decided to go inside the restaurant. We went to the door and saw that according to their hours, they were still open. When we tried the door, it was unlocked, but nobody seemed to be inside. The place was very quiet. I walked over to the counter and stood there. I thought I heard someone talking from the back, but I couldn't see them. Finally, a man walked to the front of the counter and told me that they were closed. He wasn't wearing a Taco Bell uniform though and didn't seem friendly at all. I mentioned that the hours on the door said they were still open and the man just shook his head and said that it was wrong. He started to walk away when I mentioned the screaming I had heard and asked if everything was all right. The man paused for a second and then smiled a little and stated that it was just another employee joking around. He then asked us to leave. As we turned to walk back out, I once again heard another scream. This one was very loud and I could clearly hear someone screaming for help. The man then shouted at us to get out in a very loud and angry voice. We both ran out, but as soon as we had gotten outside, we decided to call the police. I just wasn't believing that those screams were a joke, and the man definitely seemed to be hiding something. We waited in our car in the parking lot for a couple of minutes until the police showed up. They went inside, and it wasn't long until we saw them leaving with the man we had seen. Later on, it was explained to us that there had been two employees working when a man came in and attempted to rob the restaurant. One of the workers struggled with him and was knocked unconscious, and the other employee was taken to the back of the restaurant when we pulled into the drive-thru glad we shut up when we did, or the man may have gotten away with it. I'm a 20-something guy living in the middle of Tennessee. Before this bizarre experience, I'd been going to college full-time to be a paralegal. One day, though, My mother broke her hip after falling down the stairs. She was 52 at the time, and my dad had passed a long time ago, so it was on me to take care of her. We didn't really have anyone else. I was forced to make myself a part-time student because I would have to get a job to help her afford some of her medical bills. At the time, thanks to my late dad, I had a fairly new car and I figured it'd be fun and easy to deliver pizza. I loved to drive. Where I lived, there was a lot of scenery, and sometimes I even went on drives just for the sake of it. As you can probably guess, it was easy to get the job. I just applied at a few local places and called each of them the next day. Before I knew it, I was delivering pizzas wearing a Domino's hat. Delivering pizza wasn't hard, I can be completely honest with you about that, but delivering can be insanely stressful. You've got to get there at a reasonable time. You keep hoping that the order was made correctly because you can't just send it back to the kitchen when you're miles away from the restaurant. And last but not least, you find yourself praying that your next customer isn't a prank or a complete jerk. I can't tell you how many jerks I've delivered to Jerks who didn't want to pay because I wasn't able to give them one more pack of Parmesan cheese. Well, there came a day when I had to deliver a large pizza to an address I did not recognize. 
The place was about 10 miles away from the restaurant in an area we all infamously called the Boondocks. It was an area that I'd personally never been to, but when I saw it on my drive, I would describe it as a country region of town where there's only a single trashy house every five minutes on the road. And I'm not trying to be rude. These places looked beat up, old, and ransacked. It was honestly hard to believe that people still lived in those places. I was fully expecting at any moment to witness a drug deal or to have someone step out in front of my car to stop me and try to sell me meth. Needless to say, it was a bit of a creepy place. Given that it was getting dark out fast, I was ready to get the delivery over with. I arrived at the customer's address rather quickly, thank God. Luckily, this house was far cleaner than all the ones previous. It was a small white home with a short paved driveway and a seemingly untouched screen door in the front. The yard was well kept and clean and the grass looked to have been cut recently. Also, there were no cars in the driveway, but I still assumed someone was home to pick up the order. I got out hesitantly and I grabbed the pizza. The carrier was still hot enough to burn my skin if I held it in one spot for too long. This was good. It was probably our most common complaint we got, that our pizzas were too cold or not hot enough when we dropped them off. So that was one thing I didn't have to worry about. With some flimsy confidence, I began to walk up to the screen door. When I was nearly at the porch, I could now see a faint light through the front window. And that's when I saw the silhouette of someone looking out at me, someone standing there, watching me walk up to their door. Good, I thought, this will be quick. I made it to the front door, cleared my throat for whatever reason, opened the screen door, then knocked on the wooden door. With the first knock, the door slid open. The door hadn't been closed at all, so when I knocked, it opened further. But I swear, there's no way it should have opened that much from a single light knock, because the door in a matter of seconds was wide open. I could now see inside. I could see the faint lighting from what appeared to be two dim lamps in the living room. I could also see a small, maybe 28 inch TV in the living room, displaying a silent flat blue screen. For several seconds, I didn't realize that I was holding my breath. I could feel goosebumps coming up on my forearms. What in the world was going on here? Uh, hello, I said. It definitely wasn't loud enough to get anyone's attention though. So instead, without stepping through the doorway, I knocked on the open door, hoping to let someone know that I was here. I waited for at least two minutes, but I didn't hear a soul. Nobody walking or talking in the house. No sign that anyone lived there. I stood there frozen and silent, trying to listen. Behind you, a voice whispered. I felt a breath on the back of my neck, cold, chilling breath. Immediately, I spun around. I did it so quickly that I dropped the pizza inside its carrier, but I didn't care. I ran back to my car and was ready to peel out of there, but I made the mistake of looking back at that dang house. I saw it in the window the silhouette of a person standing there, still watching me. Except now, they were waving. I hauled tail out of there. When I made it back to the restaurant, I was written up for failure to deliver and for losing my pizza carrier. I thought I was going to be fired, to be honest with you, but I think my manager just went easy on me as she knew the situation with my mother. On one of my rare days off, one of the days I didn't have to work or take care of my mom or go to school, I went back to that strange neighborhood. I found that house again, but it took me a while to be sure that the place I was looking at was really the same place. Because even though it had been about two weeks since the incident, the place was a wreck. 
The screen door was hanging off of its hinges with holes in the screen. The white paint on the outside was now an off-white or nearly yellow with patches of chipped paint. And the lawn was now a jungle with random auto parts scattered about. I gathered my courage and drove back to the nearest neighbor I could find. I knocked on their door and excused my intrusion. Then I asked them if they knew anything about the strange house. To my surprise, they did. The house was the home of an old man who struggled with his drinking. Apparently, he drove his kids away from frequent abuse. And once those kids left his life for good, he took a shotgun and ended his own life. I was covered with chills as I listened to the story. It was like some sort of ghost story you'd see on TV or hear from an urban legend, but this was real. I'd lived through it. After the man told me that that house hadn't had electricity on for the past year, I thanked him for the information and I bid him good day. I stopped delivering for Domino's after that. I didn't feel like delivering to any more strange places and I got a better job offer as a manager at a local subway. Still, sometimes I get a chill on the back of my neck, and I can't help but think about that voice saying, Behind you. My name is Kenneth, I'm 22 years old, and this story happened a couple of months ago. I had just gotten a job working nights at an Amazon warehouse near where I live. On my shifts, there weren't that many of us. It would just be me on my own doing my work somewhere in the warehouse. I think it was my second night at work when the security guard who worked there introduced himself. His name was Vincent. He was a large man, slightly overweight, in his late 30s. He was friendly at first when we started talking. Mostly small talk and interest we both have. He asked if I wanted to go get a beer and maybe see a movie the following Friday, as we both had that day off. I agreed as I didn't have any plans and I don't go out too often. That Friday in the evening, me and Vincent met up at a bar near where we work. Everything went okay. We had some drinks, talked about sports and previous jobs we worked. Then we headed out to the movie theater. That's when Vincent started acting weird. We bought our tickets and headed to the theater. I needed to use the bathroom, so I went. I was standing at the urinal doing my thing when I heard a bathroom door open. I couldn't hear any footsteps, but I didn't think twice about it. Then I turned around. I saw Vincent standing there watching me. His head was down, but his eyes were up and he was just smiling at me. I jumped and I laughed saying he startled me, but Vincent just stood there looking at me. It was like he was angry almost with a weird smile. It's weird, you have to be there to understand. I just walked past him and said I would wait for him outside. That was the first red flag. Then as we were in the movie theater watching the movie, I swear he was staring at me. I wasn't certain, but I could see in the corner of my eye that he was turned staring directly at me. I was too freaked out to check, so I did my best to focus on the movie. The next thing that happened was Vincent started rubbing his hand on my thigh. That was it for me. I got up and I walked out. The next week at work, Vincent came up to me and asked if I wanted to go hang out. I looked at him confused and annoyed at the same time. I thought me up and leaving was obvious I wasn't interested and don't want anything to do with him. I told him no, I'm busy and carried on working. Fast forward a few weeks later of him asking me and hanging out and texting me, calling me, I really had enough. So the next time I saw him in work, I told him I don't want anything to do with him and to leave me alone. I turned away and carried on sorting boxes. Vincent walked away and I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Later that night, I decided to take a break and go to the bathroom. I sat inside one of the stalls to answer a few texts. I then heard some heavy boots stumping down the corridor, then into the bathroom. I opened the stall door to see what was going on. Before I could open the door, it was kicked into me, causing me to fall backwards, and then Vincent was on top of me, putting his hands all over my face, trying to cover my mouth, and then he started strangling me. I was losing consciousness, but I still remember the look of Vincent's face as he was choking me. His face was red and his eyes were wide as they could be. I thought I was going to die, but for some reason, Vincent let me go and left the bathroom. I sat up trying to catch my breath. I was still in defense mode because I thought for some reason Vincent was going to come back and kill me, but he never did, thankfully. I reported what happened to the manager. He looked on the CCTV camera 
and I called the police. You can see me walking into the bathroom and about a minute later, Vincent rushes in. At that point, Vincent had left the warehouse and went home. Well, that's what he told the police anyway. I'm going to fast forward what happens next and say due to no proof of Vincent attacking me, the charges were dropped against him. He even got to keep his job. I felt that justice had been taken away from me and there was no way I was going to continue at Amazon, especially with that maniac still working there. I left that job, obviously, and currently have a new job. I hope and pray for whoever comes into Vincent's path, stay away from him. So in 2012, my then-girlfriend and I went on a big year-long road trip through the States, working on farms along the way for room and board, and ended our trip by driving across Canada, west to east, stopping back in Nova Scotia where we lived. At some point, we got a puppy, and around the time we got to Alberta, with an extra mouth to feed, money was running out. Since I'm a carpenter, I decided to find a place to rent, and I would get a job for a few months before we kept going on our trip. We scrolled through Kijiji, the Canadian Craigslist, and eventually found an ad for a place. There was this one guy who lived in a very cool looking house and was only a short drive from where I had found a job at. He wanted someone to move in with him to help out with the bills. We started corresponding with him by email. I told him that I was going to work in the area and my girlfriend would be staying home with the puppy. Being desperate and having become accustomed to trusting strangers throughout this long trip, we agreed to send him a deposit and take the offer. We got to this place a few days later. It was in the middle of nowhere and there were no neighbors, but we had known that before. This guy looked to be about 30 to 35, small framed, and just looked like a regular working country dude. Except his expression was weird. It was like he was scared or something. He almost looked like he was ashamed of himself. He was fine with our dog being inside, though he had a dog that wasn't allowed inside. This struck me as weird since this is the cold Canadian North. Right away, he met us at the door, and I felt there was something off about him. It made me uneasy, especially since I would be going off to work every day, leaving my girlfriend alone with this creepy guy. But she didn't seem worried, and I didn't want to be controlling, so I let it go. The first night we were there, he wanted to have a few drinks with us. We obliged politely. He brought us a few cans of shitty watery beer, and meekly drank his while sitting across the kitchen table from us. We tried to relax the situation, and asked him a few friendly questions about himself. His answers were brief and quiet. He seemed to want friendship, but also seemed completely unsure of how to get it. He went over a few rules he had. Number one was to stay out of his room, which was obviously fine. Number two was that we were not allowed to go into the basement. Kind of weird. And number three was to stay away from the barn. By this point, I could imagine the headlines. Nova Scotian couple found murdered, bound in barn. That night, I didn't sleep very much. I wasn't supposed to start work for a couple of days, so I just stayed up reading and playing with our pup. I heard his truck pull out of the driveway pretty early in the morning. I headed for the basement because I just had to know what was down there. It was pretty bare. Just a few washing and drying machines and some lawn chairs. But I opened a closet door and found a weird nurse costume that looked like it was for sexual purposes a roll of duct tape, a set of handcuffs, a shotgun, and a box of shells, all sitting together on the same shelf. I woke up my girlfriend and explained that she no longer had any say in the matter and that we were leaving before he got home. We sent him a message after we left, lying, saying that one of our family members had gotten sick and we were moving back home. He never offered to return our money and we had no more contact with him. I'm still waiting to see him in the news. My ex thinks that I worry too much, but her parents thanked me profusely. And I still wonder what was inside that barn. Number two. The following story is told from a female's point of view, narrated by special guest Darkness Prevails. 
I got married when I was 19, and my husband and I had no clue what to do with our new life together. We dropped out of college, and our studio apartment was too expensive, and we thought it was the ideal time to travel and have adventures before settling down. We came across a post on the internet from a man who was looking for workers on his horse ranch. He would provide all meals and lodging in exchange for labor around the ranch. It looked like just the solution for us. He claimed to be very knowledgeable in trades and would teach us to build machinery, woodworking, welding. We actually did learn to weld, which is pretty cool, etc. The pictures were beautiful. The log cabin he built was spacious and we would have a nice big bedroom. There were lots of other people in the photos and in our correspondence with him, he always mentioned other people and referred to himself as we. He advertises on multiple platforms and everything looked really legit. We booked our flight. There was nobody else there. He was in his 60s, but mentally and physically very fit. One of the first things he said to us was, I never judge people based on their past. Do you believe people can change? I sure do. It seemed harmless enough. He took us grocery shopping and told us to pick whatever we wanted. We immediately got the vibe that his kindness was forced and that he was being over generous. I'm going to get right into listing the weird stuff we noticed. He built the house himself and his bedroom had a door to the only upstairs bathroom, which he didn't lock from the inside. He would invite us into his room and on his table was an old video camera with about 30 little tapes strewn about. He would always talk about how much he loved the Japanese, how he specifically marketed toward them and had a few Japanese ladies in the past. He often brought up people who had stayed with them before and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. One day he told us to get in the truck because we were going into the city. We were way out in the country, so it was a long ride, but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come with us and work on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. We are introverts, and it just felt very odd to approach people and ask them to get in the truck. He got upset by our disapproval, so we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He went to talk to people on his own. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give away to a very temperamental and aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy, but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. It was also extremely apparent that he did not view women as equal or anywhere near equal to men. He had had military training and was a big, strong man, cunning, always thinking. Now, our parents never wanted us to go. They realized it to be a potentially dangerous situation, but we thought we had done our due diligence. However, we never even thought to Google this guy's name. I get an email from my mom one day, freaking out and telling me to do a Google search, then get on the next plane home. A quick search showed us his arrest record, strangling and sexually assaulting a young woman, followed by headlines reading, do not go to this horse ranch. This man is dangerous. We were thoroughly creeped out and booked a flight home. We were then presented with the dilemma of how to tell a potentially dangerous man that we wanted to leave. I forgot to mention that he would tell us daily about how we could live there permanently and start a family. He would fantasize about Christmases with our future children and raising them on the ranch. We thought it was established that this was a very temporary thing and we had families back home who missed us. This is the weirdest part for me. I made up a lie about an emergency back home and when I told him, it was like he could see right through me. I'm convinced that he not only knew I was lying, but he knew I was going to lie about needing to leave before I ever opened my mouth. This look came over him that I have never seen on a person before. He was angry, but hiding it. He was hiding so many thoughts and emotions that I couldn't tell if I should be frightened or relieved. Before I finished my sentence, he said, when do you need to go to the airport? Monotone. I told him right now, he took us and put on his friendliest personality and told us that if we ever wanted to come back, he would buy our tickets. We said we'd be in touch. Just recently, I Googled his name again and discovered a page, a forum for people who had gone to his ranch, mostly couples like us with eerily similar experiences. They spoke about how he says not to judge people on their past, the grocery store, the bathroom, 
and how they heard him listening behind his door during their midnight bathroom trips, the videotapes, and how they watched them and saw young Japanese girls flexing their arms, looking through his search history and seeing nothing but Japanese pornography. They talk about how he would make rude remarks to the girlfriends and about creepy rituals in the woods, which we experienced. It was like a full moon ritual inside a circle drawn on the ground. They spoke about being driven to the city and asked to jump out when thin young ladies walked by and tell them to come back to the ranch. I could go on and on. He is still operational. This forum I found was aimed at gathering stories and preventing future visitors to the ranch. The police do not have enough evidence to convict him of anything. I know I left a lot of creepy deeds out. I didn't want this to be too long, and I'm not a great storyteller. I'm unsure whether it'd be appropriate to name the man or the ranch, but the blog where all the others have written about their encounters is probably much creepier than my story. We got away with much less weirdness because I don't believe I was his type, and he may have feared my husband. If anyone is interested, I may be able to give a few hints so it can be found. Number one. I graduated high school almost a year ago. I really had no urge to attend college or military and basically got stuck in my boring hometown for months, where I slowly became dependent on Xanax and booze and was destined to repeat the cycle of white trash that my parents had set up for me and their parents before and so on. I knew I had to leave my hometown, so I decided to sign up for a website you may have heard of called www.oof.com, Worldwide Opportunities in Organic Farming. You pay a small fee and they tell you about available organic farming operations that will feed you and allow you to stay with them in return for a certain amount of work around the farm. The place I decided to commit to was a Hare Krishna community in the Deep South. I got there and my car almost immediately broke down. It was a 30-year-old Chevy Blazer I bought on Craigslist for about $500. I later found out that it was beyond repair by this point. The closest town was about 20 miles away, so I found myself stranded, surrounded by the most unbearable hipsters. To be more specific, I would say about a third of the population of this community were either first or second generation Indian immigrants living near the temple for religious reasons. Another demographic were aging hipsters also there for spiritual purposes, but also running the small scale organic farm located on the property. Everyone else, however, self-absorbed, condescending, right out of college but vapid as shit hipsters. I basically kept to myself, but occasionally was forced into conversations about vibrating crystals and their three-year spiritual journey no doubt being funded by their parents. I had been there for weeks and was desperate for a real conversation. And then Michael showed up. I had heard stories about Michael. A couple of days before I showed up, he had left to retrieve an impounded car in a large city about an hour away. Everyone said he was lazy and insane and would spend hours in his room doing yoga instead of coming down and working with the rest of us. He showed up late in the evening, going on about how he was really going to get involved with the farming and how he was going to throw himself into the Krishna consciousness. He was in his early 30s and looked like a balding Hasidic Jew, his unwashed sideburns curled. He spoke like a stoner cartoon character, his sentences always punctuated with, and, uh, or, and like, giving his utterly fried brain time to figure out what the others wanted to hear. He reminded me of the many friends I had left back home. We became fast friends, as he was the only person there who didn't give me the urge to bite my fingers off when he spoke. We were both from Texas, so we talked about the loony conservative teachers we had in high school, football, and of course, drugs. Every now and then, he would bring up subjects that really threw me off. He wasn't able to get his car out of the impound garage, so he schemed the best way to break it out. These plans involved firearms, pipe bombs, and telepathy. He told me he came to the Hare Krishna temple to befriend some of the gurus and learn Reiki meditation, a form of meditation used to control the minds and bodies of other people. 
He told me he believed he had used Reiki once to seduce a woman at a party. This is when I understood his reputation. I simply nodded and laughed occasionally when he went off on these rants. I knew that one day I would reach a saturation point for his absurdity, but I could probably endure it for a week more. A couple of days later we were eating lunch with one of the gurus. I was telling Michael about my trip to the giant field where the Branch Davidian used to be. He wasn't sure what the Branch Davidian was, so I explained to him about Waco, David Korsh, and the botched siege operation by the FBI and ATF that led to the death of 76 Davidians and 4 ATF agents. He was enraged upon hearing this. Like, the government is always trying to silence people preaching the truth, man. Like, that's so fucked up. I wanted to explain to him that David Korsh was a sociopathic cult leader, interested in power and nothing else, but he wasn't having it. Now I was getting angry. He was throwing a tantrum about a subject I had just explained to him, and now he was telling me that I'm wrong and that Korsh was a martyr. That's when I saw the truly insane Michael. He was spitting, red as a beet, pacing back and forth. I left the table and got back to work, but he followed me. After half an hour of this absurd argument, I couldn't handle it anymore. I'm not having this conversation with a fucking lunatic, Michael. How can I expect logic from you? You came here to get superpowers. The look in his eyes changed from anger to hatred. He got real still, and then came at me. Michael was a big guy, much bigger than me. He lunged at me and I ran. As I ran, I went through my pocket, praying that I had grabbed my knife before I left my cabin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't walk around my old neighborhood without some sort of protection. Plus, it was a pretty useful tool on the farm. Luckily, I had grabbed it. I turned around and he saw it. He stopped and contemplated for about three seconds. He then turned around and finished his lunch. The next day, I pulled the temple president aside and explained to him what happened and that we should probably get rid of him. It didn't take much convincing. No one really cared for him and he wasn't much help on the farm. I felt kind of bad snitching on the guy. He was in a pretty desperate situation. He had no car, no money, and I can't imagine he had many friends. The temple president also informed me that he had been an alcoholic for 10 years and came here to get sober. I found it very strange that he never told me this. Later that day, I saw through my window someone drive up and hand him several suitcases for him to pack what little he had. I saw them both drive off to God knows where. Weeks went by and the whole encounter kind of faded from my conscience. Late one night, I got a text. Hey, this is Michael. We can get my car out for like $280. Wanna go traveling? I never responded. I'm not sure how he got my number, but I figured he looked me up on Facebook or something. A few nights later, I was in the temple office using the Wi-Fi to send some emails. I was making my walk back to my cabin, and from the pitch black, I could hear a lot of loud banging coming from the barn. I remember thinking it must be an animal, but also thinking that it must be a pretty big one to make that much noise. I entered my cabin. The actual door to the cabin doesn't have a lock, but my bedroom door did, so I used that one. I was pretty unsettled by the banging, but I figured my imagination was getting the best of me. Later that night, I woke up needing to take a piss. The cabin didn't have a bathroom, but we did have a shared outhouse. I didn't feel like putting on shoes and walking around in the dark, so I figured I would just piss in the sink. I know it's gross but I'm the only one who uses that kitchen. I opened my bedroom door and nearly pissed myself right there. Michael, completely naked, was crouching in the corner of my kitchen, facing the wall. I made a noise I wasn't aware I could make, something you would hear Shaggy make on Scooby-Doo. The noise alerted Michael to my entrance. All he did was glare at me and shake his whole body. 
I slammed my door and locked it almost immediately. I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to pacify me with Reiki meditation. I called 911. I didn't open my door or even approach it until I saw the red and blue lights outside my window. Michael wasn't there when they arrived. My guess is he ran deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. I explained to the police Michael's story and what happened that night. There wasn't much they could do since no one seemed to know anything about Michael. I didn't even know his last name. I had to leave the farm shortly after. Calling the police was really frowned upon since I believe many of the old hippies thought they were still avoiding the draft. I didn't mind leaving either. I couldn't sleep knowing Michael might still be out there in those woods, angrier than he was before. I stayed up for almost three days while I waited for my friend to come pick me up. The story I'm about to tell is not as scary as it is sad, but don't be fooled. There were many moments during this time that I was scared out of my mind. Although I'm here to put some fear into readers, it's also a great opportunity to educate everyone on the dangers related to a common milady. So, turn out the lights and get comfortable. Here comes my scary tale of the nicest, but creepiest roommate I've ever had. Upon graduating high school, my parents hit me with the ultimatum, You're a man now. It's time you start paying us rent or move out and get your own place. Heck, I wasn't about to pay my folks to live with them, so the hunt for an apartment started immediately. Fortunately, I had a job for a couple of years, so I had some money saved up. I think my parents thought I would choose to stay at home and they'd be able to get a piece of it, but I've been looking for an excuse to get away from them and they gave it to me. It wasn't long before I found a place with a friend of mine riding his couch. This wasn't my long-term plan, of course, but it gave me a chance to get away from my parents. Within that month, I found a guy from work who had just been forced to kick his roommate out of their place for not paying as part of the rent. This dude was really cool and possibly the kindest guy I'd ever met, but he wasn't a pushover. We talked about each of our predicaments and decided I would take his former roommate's place, and it's where I would stay until just recently. We got along great, probably because we were a lot alike, and it also helped we work different shifts. Our days off were spent on the couch playing Halo and throwing down many bottles of beer. Drug tests at work prevented us from enjoying things of an herbal variety, but we managed to have a good time anyway. Nothing out of the ordinary happened for the first few months, but one night, I got a shock of a lifetime. I had crashed out early one night after working a 12-hour shift, the third of that week. I'm not sure what the time was, but at some point, a loud banging at my door drew me from my sleep. In a slow and groggy state, I rolled over to see what had caused it. That's when I came eye to eye with my roommate. I was so shocked I could have jumped out of my skin. After taking a second to catch my breath, I yelled at him. Dude, what? But the reaction I expected never came. Turning on my overhead lamp, I still received no feedback. Utterly confused, I walked up to him and stared directly at his face. He just looked ahead standing like a statue, saying nothing. This is when I realized that he must be sleepwalking. Although I considered waking him up, I seemed to have remembered that you weren't supposed to do it, so I slowly turned him around and walked him back to his room. When we got there, I told him to go to bed, and believe it or not, he did. Very pleased with myself and still horribly tired, I went back to my room and locked the door. The rest of the night was happily uneventful. The next time I saw him, which was about two days later, I timidly mentioned it to him. I was unsure if he was even aware he did it, and I didn't want to embarrass him. To my relief, he was well aware of his condition. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Like most things in his life, he was able to laugh it off. He did, however, apologize for scaring me and assured me that I handled it the right way. I more than likely wouldn't have been able to wake him up anyway. In the future, he would be sure to lock his bedroom door and suggested I do the same. There was no guarantee it would keep him in or out, but it was worth a shot. I'd had no other run-ins with my zombie roomie for another four months, and when I did, I handled it the same way as I had before. 
After thinking about it for a while, it seemed stupid to get mad about the situation. It wasn't something he could control. Besides, there were certain protocols I could take to keep him out of my room at night, and once I did, I never received another nocturnal visit again. Sadly, by the end of that year, it would cease to be a worry in either of our lives. On December 3rd, I had only just returned from a three-day vacation, a vacation my boss had forced me to take because I was grossly over-accrued on my vacation time. I didn't tell him, but I was hoping to combine that time with the other three days I had coming so I could drink all the way through the holidays till January 3rd. Since my plans had been ruined, my mood was on the bad side. I was vegging out on the couch when I got a phone call from work. The moment I saw the number on my phone, it put me in an even worse mood, but I decided to answer it in case it was my roommate that was the one calling. Is your roommate there? He hasn't shown up for work today. Unfortunately, it was my boss. I was quick to remind him in the kindest way possible, of course, that I was not his mother and I had not seen him in a few days. My boss asked me to check his room and see if he was still sleeping, and I did because he was my boss, but he was nowhere to be seen. His bed was still messed up, which was strange. His anal retentive nature would never let him leave the house without making it. I promised my boss I'd call him if I heard from him, and I hung up. As soon as I hung up, I called my roomie, but got no answer. Doing the only thing I could, I left a message and went on with my day. There was still no return calls that evening. It really was unlike him to drop off the map like this, but he must have had his reasons. The next morning, I checked in on his room to see what time he'd finally came back, but everything still looked as it had the day before. It was definitely a head-scratcher. This type of behavior was very unlike him. You never know, though. I'd only known him a couple of years. Maybe he had a dark side I'd never seen. Shortly before I left the apartment for work, my phone rang. I checked the caller ID. It was a number I didn't recognize, but then an idea hit me. He must have lost his phone. And I answered it, trying not to laugh at him. Is this Anthony Curtis? The voice on the other end was not who I expected. I said yes, and his next question was if I was a friend of my roommate. And I answered yes once again. Before he could ask me another question, I asked him one. Who are you and what do you want? His answer threw me for a loop. I'm sorry, Mr. Curtis. My name is Detective Jones with Littleton Police Department. I'm afraid your roommate, Daniel Grant, has been in an auto accident and I regret to inform you he passed away at the hospital in the early hours of December 3rd. All I could say back to him was, What? Shock could not begin to describe what I felt that moment. I guess I had gone silent because at some point I heard him saying, Hello, are you still there? After I took a deep, jagged breath, I was finally ready to answer him. Yeah. I'm here. What happened? Where did this occur? I was full of questions. He should have been in his room at that time sleeping, not in public. I continued to ask the cop questions. All we know at this time, sir, was that he was involved in a single car crash. He collided with a power pole as he ran off the road. His next series of questions would begin to unravel the mystery. Are you aware of any reason why Mr. Grant should have been on the road that time of night? I told him. Oh, that's the strange thing. He should have been home sleeping. He had work that afternoon. He had never went out at night regardless. Well, it was strange that he was driving only wearing his boxers. That's when the whole thing clicked into place. I think I understand now, detective. He was a sleepwalker. He must have been driving in his sleep. Our discussion continued for a few minutes longer, and then I made the terrible call to his parents to notify them of the accident. They drove into town from Pueblo the next day. The arrangements were made to return his body to Pueblo and the date and time of the funeral was set for three days later. Just to show how loved he was by everyone who knew him, our supervisors halted all work for that day to allow everyone to attend the funeral. I'm not a fan of funerals overall, but this was one I would never have dreamed of missing. 
Sending my best friend off right was the least I could do for him. The complete facts of the story were soon released and it seemed to have played out just as I feared. Danny had sleepwalked his way out of his locked bedroom door, out to his car and down the road. I had no idea sleepwalking could go this far, but after a discussion with my doctor, I learned how serious the condition could become. Despite the fact neither of us had any idea of how dangerous his sleepwalking could be, I can't help but feel a small amount of guilt in relation to his death. Maybe if we had done some research, we could have put some safeguards into place. But honestly, how safe would a pair of two 20-year-olds really have been? One of us probably would have passed out after a long night of video games and drinking and left the doors unlocked. The fact is, Danny's death was a freak accident, plain and simple. I stayed in our apartment for a couple of years more and just recently decided to let it go once my girlfriend and I found a house to rent together. I guess I stayed around so long without finding another roommate because it would have made his death more real. My girlfriend and I would often do the same things Danny and I did on my days off and it was almost as fun as the old days but in the end I realized as long as I stayed in that apartment I would never truly be able to accept he was gone. So last month the decision was made to pass the place on to another pair of young guys from work. They had been having a hard time finding a place to rent and since I'd been in their position not that long ago it was the right thing to do. I truly hope they have as much fun in that place as Danny and I did and that their friendship doesn't end in such a tragic way as ours. In the run-up to Valentine's Day of 2015, I found myself with a rather unfamiliar feeling. Loneliness. From 2010 onwards, I had been so focused on med school that I was content to barely have a social life and content to have a non-existent romantic life. I told myself that it could all wait until I was done with school and that frankly it would be irresponsible for me to curate distractions for myself while I was trying to reach the first milestone in my career goals. But after most of my high school friends had graduated and my social media feed began to swell with pictures of their dates, weddings, and pregnancy pictures, I began to feel like that I was really missing out. Call it social pressure or just plain loneliness, but I began to tell myself that it wouldn't be terrible if I just did a little casual dating, especially around the most romantic time of the year. So I did what most younger folks my age do and I downloaded one or two of the more popular dating apps. Being a woman and all, I didn't have any trouble getting matches. The trouble was actually finding a guy I liked after the opening conversation. So many of them seemed either too into it or clingy or way too cool and uninterested. The last thing I wanted was someone who'd badger me during intense periods of study, but I also didn't want to just be some player's option either. I know that sounds like I was asking for the impossible and trust me, for a while, I thought I was being way too picky. But then came a guy that we'll call Ryan, and I only give him a fake name to protect the innocent. Ryan seemed charming, intelligent, and respectful, but he also took a while to answer my messages. I know that last part seems like a weird thing to count as a virtue, but I wanted a guy who had his own stuff going on. I liked the idea that he was sometimes just too busy to talk, and I guess that's because I saw a little of myself in him, but I digress. Out of all the guys I spoke to, Ryan was 100% the leading candidate. So there came a point where I straight up asked him if he had any Valentine's Day plans. I'm quick to add that I didn't ask him out. I just asked if he had plans, then waited for him to take the hint. Thankfully, he did, and he told me he knew of this cute little Portuguese bistro type place that did some of the best seafood he'd ever had. Now, he didn't know this, I have the most boring Anglophone surname ever, but I'm actually a quarter Portuguese, so I basically jumped on the offer and got super excited for the date. Valentine's Day fell on a Saturday that year, and I remember that because we ended up having to stew on a waiting list before our reservation was confirmed. Obviously, the will-we-won't-we drama had me even more excited than before, and when the time came to actually go meet him, 
I was feeling very romantic indeed. He looked amazing too. Three-piece suit, perfect hair, plus a little tactical stubble that accentuated his masculinity. Then when he took off his jacket, hung it over the back of his chair, then rolled the sleeves of his white shirt up, my god, I thought I was going to explode with the desire right then and there. We talked, picked out some appetizers, and for about 45 minutes the date was going incredibly well. But then, I saw two people walk into the bistro that looked very, very out of place. Ryan had his back to the door so he didn't see them walk in, but I did. And right away, their state trooper uniform stuck out like a sore thumb. I'm sure you know the kind I'm talking about. The smoky bear hat with the super shiny tie clip thing. But as much as they initially grabbed my attention, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt Ryan in the middle of an anecdote. He definitely noticed me looking over his shoulder, but they were nothing but momentary glances, so not nearly enough for him to stop talking and looking around. Out of my peripheral vision, I see the cops being greeted by the restaurant's maitre d'. Then, I see the maitre d' pointing in our general direction. But again, nothing to be too concerned about. But then, the two cops started walking past a row of tables in our direction, and this is when I have to break eye contact and look up at them, because they stop right next to our table. Again, I've changed some of the details to protect the innocent. Sir? One of them said. Ryan looked up before the cop continued. Are you Ryan Smith of 111 Residential Street? Ryan responded in the affirmative, then asked if there was a problem. My heart and mind are both racing by this point, and in those few split seconds, I figured something terrible had happened to someone Ryan knew. That, or there had been like a break-in in his home or something. I never, ever would have guessed what the cop said next not in a million years. Then, as almost everyone in the restaurant is looking at us, wait and kitchen staff included, one of the cops says, Ryan Smith, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of... Enter girl's name here. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Etc, etc, etc. And I think my jaw must have been touching the tablecloth as I felt my face burning with embarrassment. Like I said, almost everyone in the bistro was looking at Ryan as the cops walked him out in cuffs. Then suddenly, once he was in the back of the cop car, they all started looking at me. I can safely say without a shadow of doubt that this was the single worst moment of my life so far. It was a cocktail of absolute horror for me. Everyone's eyes on me coupled with the embarrassment of having my date arrested while assuming everyone was thinking, what kind of girl goes out with a murder suspect? Is she dumb? Is she in on it? It was just awful. And then it hit me that if he really had killed some poor girl, was I his next intended victim? Did I just avoid being murdered by a matter of minutes, hours, days, or weeks? Was he looking at me with those big warm brown eyes while thinking, she's so smart and pretty? Or was he looking at me all hungry because he couldn't wait to hurt me? I barely remember walking out of the bistro and the next day when I returned to pick my car up, I had to ask the maitre d' if I had walked out without paying. Turns out I hadn't actually paid, but the restaurant's owner overheard about the whole thing and told me that all the food and drink we'd consumed was on the house. It's a little acts of kindness like this which slowly restored my faith in humanity because, believe it, it had been badly shaken by the events of that Valentine's evening. I only really remember getting into the front seat of my car, calling my mom, then just ugly sobbing into the phone while she asked me, Are you okay? What happened, honey? Over and over again. Once I was finally able to get the words out, she told me not to drive home in such a state and to take a cab, and she was right. Even though I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol that evening, I was definitely in no fit state to drive. I suppose at that point I should just cut to the chase and tell you all what you want to know. And yes, Ryan was convicted of murdering the girl whose name I've chosen to admit. I was actually kind of hoping it was all just some horrible mistake, and that I hadn't seemed so dumb or naive to have gone on a date with an actual murderer. But nope, 
As the months went on, it progressed from an arrest to a trial to a full-on murder conviction. Ryan had gone on a date with some sweet, unsuspecting girl, taken her back to his apartment, then strangled her to death in the middle of being intimate. I remember my roommate saying that it might have been a kind of horrid accident, but it wasn't. Ryan had deliberately killed her, at a time when she literally couldn't have been more vulnerable. It might seem strange, but I did end up finding a kind of closure after the whole thing, and I recommend this variety of cognitive behavioral therapy to anyone who suffered a similar trauma. I wrote Ryan a letter, or more accurately, I wrote a letter to a prisoner number and addressed it to the correctional facility he was being held at. I couldn't even bear to write his name, nor could I bring myself to write mine either. He'd know who I was, I was certain of it, and in the letter I told him in no uncertain terms that I hoped he would rot and burn forever. I told him a bunch of other things too, but those aren't fit enough to be reprinted anywhere remotely civilized. I don't know if he ever opened or read the letter, but the detective that I was in contact with informed me that it would most certainly be delivered. I hope he read my letter, and I hope it cut him up inside. I wanted him to feel as mortified and ashamed as I did in that bistro on that chilly Valentine's evening. I wanted him to read my words, and as he was reading, I wanted him to pray for the ground to just open up wide and swallow him whole, just as I did when all those people were looking at me with burning judgment in their eyes. I wanted so many things from that letter, but I only got one of them. Closure. Some of you might be wondering why I haven't named anyone or anyone in this account. It's for a number of reasons, but the primary one, I know this for certain, is that the family of the girl my date had murdered requested the privacy and space to grieve following his trial. Unfortunately, this wasn't respected by elements of the local and national media, and the family ended up suing one of the more unscrupulous publications regarding an article they posted online. If you ask me, it was righteous litigation, and although I wouldn't be all that worried about them suing me, given how closely connected I am with the case, I'd like to respect their wishes for privacy and anonymity. On top of that, I'd like you to respect my privacy and anonymity, at least until my prospective killer is released. Because then, I'll go public, truly public, and no matter how much my prospective killer tries to carve out a new life, a new identity, or a new existence, I'm determined to make sure that everyone knows what a monster he really is. Back when I was still in high school, I used to work as a waiter at this super fancy restaurant on the corner of the common. I worked there for two Valentine's Days, and I've never understood why people didn't want to work them. Not the first year, anyway. Tips? They were awesome. So the next year, when I wasn't even on shift, it was real easy just to make a swap so I could get all those Valentine's tips. So, this guy comes in, good looking dude, but his girl was like, Rihanna level hot. It was all eyes on her all night long. There was almost a fist fight in the back to decide who got to wait that table. Okay, maybe not a fist fight, but I personally witnessed two games of rock, paper, scissors, and they were low-key intense. Anyway, the night goes on, we're working steadily, and the tips are just mounting up hour by hour. The dude was treating his girl to all kinds of bougie cocktails, insisting she have dessert the most expensive entree, stuff like that. And the whole time we're just like, yes dude, boost that percentage, boost it. It wasn't my table so I couldn't keep track of the exact amount he dropped on her but I know it must have been like 5 hundy and change based on the pricing. But as they're wrapping up, I'm just waiting to see what kind of cut I'd be getting. When out of nowhere, a solo girl walks into the main dining area. She's not wearing anything fancy, She's looking like she'd actually been crying, and I remember watching her look around the dining room for a second or two before honing in on the dude and his Rihanna twin. You know when you just know something messed up is about to happen, and you can just feel the tension rising in the room before it suddenly explodes? I think everyone in the main dining room picked up on that as she powered over to the Rihanna girl and started screaming in her face. 
I remember watching our bartender, this big tattooed dude called Harley, walking over to her, getting ready to separate them or whatever. But before he got there, the crazy girl grabs one of the wine glasses from the table and just yeets it into the Rihanna girl's face. Harley goes from zero to a hundred trying to get over to stop it. This place was super fancy so it didn't have security or anything hanging around anywhere. In fact, we barely had any trouble at all. So when the situation exploded and diners were screaming and trying to get away, Harley was slowed down by all these people trying to get out of the dining room while he was trying to get in. Then in the meantime, the girl is just going ham on Rihanna with this broken wine glass. Before I actually come out of shock in time to act on it, she's picked up another glass and yeeted that one into her face too. Then get this, instead of actually helping his date, the guy actually just bailed out of the booth and ran out of the restaurant along with the rest of the customers. Total scumbag move, man, and something I'll never forget. Seconds later, me, Harley, and the rest of the waiting staff had basically body slammed the crazy girl away from Rihanna, while she herself had slumped down under the table to get away from the attack. The cops eventually showed up, took the crazy girl away, and once the scene was safe and clear, the EMT showed up to treat the injured girl. I hadn't seen her at any point after the attack, not until the EMTs actually started treating her. And honestly, I couldn't even recognize her face. All around her eyes and nose, it just looked like ripped up red, and her upper lip was almost cut all the way in half so you could see gums and teeth and stuff. It was one of the most horrific, upsetting things I'd ever seen. And every single Valentine's Day since, I'm reminded of that poor girl and the horrific injuries she suffered at the hands of that psycho ex, or whoever she was. My grandfather grew up in Jacksonville, Texas back in the 1950s, and if you've never been there, you wouldn't be missing much. He grew up the eldest of five brothers and sisters on a farm with my great-grandparents. He passed away about a year ago, but I wanted to share a story he told me when I came home from college break. Naturally, Grandpa didn't come from much. His parents' generation suffered through the Great Depression, and farmers didn't fare off too well. But being the gritty Texas farm folk that they were, they thrived in it. Having a farm and a big pasture surrounded by pine trees made for a good childhood, as he told me. He would reminisce about the times of gathering the whole town's kids and playing baseball games to pass the hot summer days. Though as his health deteriorated, he began to talk more deeply with me, and would talk to me about life lessons, and one thing in particular, fear. He asked me if I had ever heard of witches. I said of course, but he stopped me, and as serious as he could be, he asked me again. Listen, I ain't talking about no Halloween characters. I'm talking about actual witches. I could tell it made him uncomfortable talking about it. It really screwed him up as a kid. He explained to me that he had three encounters growing up. The first time he saw her, he was ten. He and his siblings were playing around sundown. They were outside in the pasture. About 200 yards away from him, there was a tree line where a forest began. He said that he saw a dark floating silhouette by the tree line. He couldn't focus on it because of the lack of lighting, but he swore to me that the figure's head was cocked at a perfect 90 degree angle looking right at him. He said it was inhuman. He remembers rushing the little ones back inside and telling his parents, their parents never let them out after sundown again. The second encounter came two years later. He and a friend who was their closest neighbor would walk on a trail through the forest to school every day. He said it was about a two and a half mile walk. One day as they were walking home, they saw a homeless person covered in quilts walking on the left side of the trail. Being very confused and uneasy as to why somebody they didn't know who was completely submerged in dirty quilts would be walking on this trail in the woods. As the person passed, he said they both smelled something that was a mix of rot and sour. 
Upon smelling the putrid odor, Grandpa said that he became very dizzy and incoherent, and the neighbor boy felt the same way. A few moments later, they hear a sinister giggle from behind them. <laughs> they turn to see this person, who was still completely hidden by the quilts, began running after them. He said the thing didn't stop chasing them until they busted down the front door of the farmhouse. He never saw the neighbor boy again after that day. The incident was widely spread around town and quickly became a warning for all those who would venture in the woods. The third and last time he saw the witch was when he was a senior in high school. Grandpa was going to be a Division I football player for the University of Oklahoma and quite frankly was the hometown hero. He said that he just met my grandmother and really wanted to enjoy the rest of his senior year. So he attended a prom after party in the woods with his classmates. Being that his class only had 60 people, everyone was there. He admitted that he got pretty wasted that night. He went to go take a leak a couple of yards away from the bonfire. While he was draining his lizard, he heard shuffling noises from nearby. As he tried to focus, he made out a small hut through the trees. There was a stream of smoke emanating from its chimney. He smelled a stench that he recognized from when he was 12. He told me that nothing else could have sobered him up so quickly. He proceeded to investigate the hut deep in the forest. As he approached, a dark figure appeared from the shadows. But he told me that no matter how hard he tried, he never could quite make it out. All of a sudden, the figure started to whisper. It intensified, and he felt a burning sensation on his arm. He felt as if his body was being branded. The figure then slowly faded back into the darkness of the forest. He became frantic and realized that he was now 100 yards away from everyone. He said that there was no way he had wandered off that far. He began screaming for help. He admitted to me that he even wet his pants. The creepiest part about this story is that the police investigated the hut that my grandpa discovered. Inside was a gore fest. There was dead animals strewn about the floor as well as human remains, who some believed to be the missing neighbor boy. They never found out who was responsible, and my grandfather moved away shortly after. My grandfather was a fantastic man, and I miss him a lot. He was the most kind, loving man I ever knew, and I know that he wouldn't make any of this up, and I've also always wondered where he got the burn mark on his arm. Some backstory before I begin. I work for a conservation corps based out of Austin, Texas. We do a lot of environmentally based projects, such as trail maintenance, wild firefighting, invasive species removal, etc. One day this past spring we were working in Jasper, Texas, doing invasive species removal on Nature Conservancy property. We were clearing any and all species that were not longleaf, shortleaf, or loblolly pine trees. The property was about 60 acres, so we were flying through this project trying to complete it. Most of our chainsaws had run into problems and were not working properly, so we ended up having to split up into groups. I worked in a crew of eight, and we only had four saws running, so groups of two was the reasonable way to run things. I was working with one of my co-workers, Joe. We were on an area of property that the crew had not been to yet. Our job was to cut a trail about a mile into the property and proceed to make our way around the 60 acres. We began to saw our way in at around 7.45 a.m. We had to hike in our fuel, bar oil for the chainsaw, our wedges, and our packs. We each carried a hatchet in case we needed an extra wedge or for any other reason, as well as flagging to mark the trail. At around 9, we had reached our halfway point and decided to take a short break. I shut off the chainsaw took my chaps off, and drank some water to cool off. I placed my pack against the tree, and Joe did the same. We began shooting the shit. Nothing unusual. Just some stupid banter to get through the day. As we were talking, something snapped in the brush about 30 feet to the west of us. I instantly stopped talking, and grabbed our hatchets. This area was known to have wild boar. We knew what to do in this situation if a wild boar was to show up. 
Nevertheless, we were scared. We slowly walked over to the brush, and as we approached, another snap came from our south, about 30 feet in the dense brush. At that point, we were starting to get nervous. We had no plan if two boar were to show up. We decided that it was best to grab our packs and find our way back to the crew. They would understand us ceasing work for two boar. As we slowly made our way back to our packs, snaps came from every direction. We had nowhere to go. My first thought was to grab the chainsaw and turn it on. I revved up the engine, but it promptly died. Great. Another saw down. In simple terms, we were screwed. We decided to make a run for it at that point. I counted down from five, and we both ran down the trail as fast as we could into the thick swampy brush. We sprinted as fast as humanly possible towards camp, but something made us stop. Joe and I, at the same moment, stopped running. We stood there not knowing what to do. Joe began to look around frantically, and as he did, I felt a cold breeze wisp down my back. A deep voice whispered something into my ear, but before I could even comprehend the words, I took my hatchet and swung blindly behind me. To my surprise and terror, it struck something hard. As I turned my head to see what creature had just met its doom, I heard Joe gasp. As my head swiveled, behind me was a tree. This may sound normal, but we had cleared this area of all life not but 30 minutes prior. The chances of us missing a 2 foot wide, 60 foot tall tree were zero. Realizing that this was only a tree, I looked back at Joe, ready to laugh. But as soon as I turned around, Joe was gone. I chuckled and started to call out his name. After about two minutes, I began to freak out. I began frantically searching the surrounding area but Joe seemed to have vanished into nothing. After another 10 minutes of searching, I decided that he may have been so scared that he ran back to camp, so I began to make my way back. When I arrived, everything was completely normal. Everything but the fact that Joe wasn't there. I told everyone that Joe had gone missing after we had a run-in with some boar. We all spread out. We looked for Joe for an hour before deciding to call the authorities. They arrived shortly after. We set up search parties to find Joe. After about 10 minutes of searching, he was found. Joe sat on a tree stump, pale as the moon, staring off into space. I called out to him, but when he looked at me, I noticed blood running down his stomach. There was a tree branch sticking out of Joe's gut. I sprinted over to him as he fainted and caught him before he hit the ground. The police rushed Joe to the nearest hospital. Before we left, I noticed something odd. Joe had been sitting on a stump of a tree that I had rammed my hatchet into. The tree was no longer standing, and my hatchet was sitting in the dirt, covered in blood. My stomach dropped, and I immediately walked with my crew back to camp, leaving my hatchet behind. We packed up our campsite and left Jasper that night. We were never sent back to that property. Shortly after, an article surfaced in the news of a Nature Conservancy surveyor who disappeared in the same forest. They found him a week later impaled next to a tree stump. I can only assume it was the same stump that we found Joe next to. I experienced this back when I was 14. Now I am 23 years old. Back then I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Montana. Behind my home, there was a forest. Now, I had never stepped a foot into those woods until that day. The only time I'd ever even gotten close to that forest was when I was tasked with walking my family dog, Charlie. Now, Charlie was a big dog. I had never seen him cower before. On one of our walks, I heard a noise in the woods. It was the sound of a branch snapping. Uh, occasionally, whenever I took walks with Charlie... I would keep hearing these noises. One thing to mention though, is that whenever I took Charlie out during the day, nothing would happen. But during dusk or dawn or even nighttime, I would always hear this noise. The day I decided to head in was an extraordinary day because it was my 14th birthday. After everyone was in bed, 
I had snuck our Charlie, and we navigated our way through. Or, well, tried to. We ended up getting lost and came upon an abandoned shed. Then, the last thing I expected happened. Charlie started whimpering. That was never a good sign. I had wondered if there was someone there, but I couldn't see anybody. I didn't think I would need any form of protection, so I didn't have any. And then, I heard the sounds. A crunch here and a snap there, and the animals went quiet. I was terrified, so all I could do was run to the shed and hide. Something got closer. I heard the leaves crunching. It was the only way I could tell how close it was. Then, a loud bang resonated through the woods. It was walking on top of the roof. I couldn't stop shaking, but I'd like to think that Charlie could tell how scared I was because he started licking me. Around five or ten minutes later, it hopped off the roof and I peeked out the nearest window. There was a human-like creature out there. Grotesque, with long limbs, pale skin like the moon, jagged bones and joints. It was extremely thin. Its spine was protruding underneath its skin. Instead of bumps on the spine, they were like tips of a knife. I felt sick to my stomach, and I almost hurled right then and there. I felt like I was seeing something I shouldn't. I managed to see its face. It was roundish. Its eyes were beady and black. They looked soulless, but I'm not completely sure. They were glassy like the eyes of a doll. Lifeless, and soon it had started to walk away but not without turning back to me and letting out this demonic roar, like the roar of a lion mixed with the caw of a raven. I think it knew I was there. I don't know what prevented it from killing me, but whatever it was, I am eternally grateful. Remember, if there are woods near you and you hear strange sounds, never forget that there are things out there that won't be as merciful as it was to me. If anybody knows what this may have been, Please let me know in the comments down below. I'm incredibly curious. It all started on the 7th of February. The small independent coffee shop I was working at had decided to throw up a few decorations for Valentine's Day. So myself and a few colleagues had spent pretty much our entire shift putting up pink and red bunting, writing romantic quotations around the edges of our blackboard menu, and other romantically themed stuff. It was a fun way to spend a shift, but as I clocked out and began the short walk back to my flat, I began to feel a slight pang of loneliness, knowing I'd be single and alone on the day itself. I consider Tinder or Bumble to try and bag myself a date, but the chances of securing myself a boy that I actually genuinely liked over the next seven days was slim to none, so I resigned myself to another Valentine's on my own. But when I got home to find a pink envelope in my mailbox, I must admit that it brought a little smile to my face. A secret admirer, like something right out of a cheap romance paperback, might not be every girl's cup of tea. But to be honest, it really cheered me up, even if it was from a friend or the nice lady that lived on the ground floor flat. Only when I open the thing up, it just says, seven days to go. No romantic message, no kisses or hearts, just those three words scrawled hastily onto the paper inside. It's then I realized there's nothing on the envelope or the paper it contained that confirmed it was actually addressed to me. No name, no address, nothing. I started to feel a tad silly, like, what if it wasn't meant for me at all? What if someone had sent their little Valentine's card to the wrong person? I told myself I was just being silly, but kept the envelope and card as I walked upstairs to my flat and got on with my evening. I honestly think I'd forgotten the whole thing by the next morning when I got up and set off to work again, but when I got home there was a stark reminder that this was no mistake. Arriving back at my flat, I checked my mail to find yet another pink envelope inside. Not only that, but a small brown paper package was stuffed inside too. Again, I have to admit to being kind of excited about the whole thing. There definitely hadn't been a mistake of address or anything. I mean, the person must have had to put all that stuff in there themselves. Maybe I really did have a secret admirer, and that Valentine's was about to become something out of a fairy tale. 
but as soon as I opened the package, I knew something wasn't quite right. Inside was a small brown teddy bear. Only it wasn't newly bought, nor had it been looked after very well in what was obviously a long and grubby existence. To be frank, it was filthy. The thing looked like it hadn't been washed in years, decades even. The fur was all grimy and matted together, and one of its glasses was missing, probably having been pulled out by a child some years before. The note inside the envelope was pretty much the same as the last one, only this time it read, Six days to go. That's about the time that I realized that whoever was sending these wasn't exactly all there, and what had previously been a kind of giddy excitement turned into nervous anticipation. And the more I let my mind dwell on it, the more and more frightened I became. This wasn't going to be some dream romance. In fact, it was more likely to be the polar opposite. I told a friend in work about the whole thing and they seemed to take it much more seriously than I had. They told me I obviously had a stalker, that even if this person was doing this stuff out of affection, it was still crossing a number of personal boundaries and I should consider contacting the police. But to tell them exactly what? That I had a note addressed to no one, from no one, with absolutely no other details than I'd found them in my mailbox. Alright, it wasn't exactly the dream romantic gestures that I think all girls kind of crave, but at the same time, why cause someone the distress of calling the cops on them? That felt kind of cruel. But after returning home that evening to something else in my apartment, I didn't feel so apprehensive about contacting them. I arrived home again that evening to find exactly what I expected in my mailbox. Another note, this time reading, yep, you guessed it, five days to go. I stormed up to my apartment, grabbed a piece of notepaper and a sharpie, and wrote out something along the lines of, whoever is leaving stuff in my mailbox, please stop. It was sweet at first, but now it's kind of creepy. No more, or I call the police. I made an effort not to come across as too rude or aggressive, but I also needed to make it clear that I really, really didn't appreciate their unwanted attention. I taped the note to the front entrance of my apartment building before I went to bed, hoping whoever it was would get the message and leave me alone. So, little side note, I get a shower before bed every night, every night without fail. I'm almost sort of a clean freak. I keep my bathroom pretty much spotless. So as I finish getting washed, something small catches my eye. Something that might not even gain the attention of most people, but to me, it stuck out like a sore thumb. A flash of color in what is an otherwise pristine white bathroom. On the window's ledge was a tiny, glassy dome shape, just sat there on its own. I approached curiously peering down at it for a few moments before I completely freaked out and ran out of the bathroom to call the cops. It was a small, glass eye, a minuscule amount of fabric woven into the back of it. I recognized it almost instantly as the missing eye from the teddy bear that I'd found in my mailbox. While I was on the phone to the police, I realized a few things about my prospective valentine. As I said, I get a shower every evening before bed, I like hot showers, the steamier the better, so naturally the bathroom windows spends a lot of time ajar to let out the moisture. Whoever managed to put that glass eye on the bathroom window ledge had known my evening routine. They had obviously been watching me for long enough to work out the exact place to put something so that I'd see it. But it was their method that really creeped me out. The way they used the small Teddy's eye to tell me in so many words that they were watching me. I swapped the note out I'd written for one that simply read, The police have been contacted. Leave me alone. And leave me alone they did. But the whole thing had a pretty serious effect on my psyche for a long time afterwards. Sometimes I'd find myself staring at someone in the coffee shop or someone walking past my flat, wondering if it was them. If one day one of them would look over and smile. And I'd just know. They'd not given up just yet.